Publishing. The Art of Thinking. Hello there. So I'm here with uh, Stephen Lawrence, who is one of the more interesting uh, writers and people chatting on the internet today, who I've had the good fortune of uh, having to be able to interact with over the past few years. So um, as far as I know, you are not just a writer, but you also collate articles on different websites. So in a way, you're a kind of a roundabout researcher and you're also a teacher. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, um, I am. A, I'm a, currently an associate professor um, in the Department of Humanities at the um, Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology. Wow. So are you specializing in uh, English, political science, history? What do you teach exactly? Uh, well, I, I actually specialize in, um, it goes by many names, uh, but one of the names is developmental writing, reading and writing developmental courses in reading, writing, and oral communication. Um, but I also teach the traditional ones like composition classes and professional communication. And for the past three years, I've been teaching contemporary social issues, which I really love. So I can imagine what, you would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. so how long have you been teaching and how did you get into um, this line of scholarship? Huh. Um, well, I've been te well, okay, so maybe I can say that I've been in the education field since 1996, mm -hmm. so pretty long time. Um, and I've had so many different types of teaching jobs. My first one was in the summer of 96. I was a reading recovery specialist. Um, it, was a, it was for a for-profit reading program called Linda Mood Bell Learning Associates. And um, they trained me so well in how to help young people decode or break words into syllables and how to recognize uh, what are called phonemes, which mm -hmm. are mechanical sounds that the mouth makes, you know. So it's, that was the beginning. And then I became a substitute teacher in a large district. And I did that off and on for, well, long, long time. And then I became more into it. I thought, geez, so I think I might like this kind of thing. And maybe I should kind of do something. And then I broke my hand. Oh, and a car accident. I broke broke my fourth metacarpal, and in order to and I had at the time I was a long term substitute teacher and I was teaching a bilingual Spanish class actually. Um, I think it was fifth, fourth and fifth grade, for a teacher out on maternity leave, and I got health insurance because it was long term um, position. And um, in order to keep my health insurance because I needed a lot of physical therapy to get my hand working again because it was like wasn't working. Uh, after the surgery, it was like this big sausage, really big thing that just didn't work. Uh, and so I got the physical therapy. And so to keep the health insurance, I decided, well, I'm just going to have to actually apply for a full-time position. So it was really yeah, a car accident that got me into it as a full-time actual instructor. And I taught English, you know, for, for several years. So this is interesting. I'm always fascinated by people who kind of go back and forth between teaching in college versus teaching in high school or below. So what were the age ranges of people you were teaching throughout these years? It's a, uh, it's a, it's, it's just, I have been, I'm a very lucky person when it comes to um, surveying the terrain of education. Mm -hmm. I really, uh, I don't think, I don't know anyone more lucky than I personally in the sense that I have taught all the grades and I'm not, I'm saying that when you're, when you're a substitute in a Boston public school system for 20, 25, well, for maybe 10 years as a substitute, you substitute, you wind up everywhere, you know, you're, you're, you're with kindergartenism on Monday and the next day you're, you know, bilingual class and, you know, uh, day three, you're hanging out doing gym, you know, kids are throwing a kickball at you. Um, and then I wind up and then I'll be, you know, in high school. And so I've been... I've taught all grades, um, and now uh, when I was a journalism teacher for four years, I taught uh, all the grades as well because it was a K to eight school. Wow! And, and and I also taught that means I also taught advanced work classes, so I've been in the cream of the crop, right? And it, academically, that is, and uh, and I would also teach classes where for students who had developmental disabilities, so mm -hmm. I had to learn how to work with autistic children and. 
you know, um, and throughout all that, uh, of course, I was studying education in grad school for, for some of that time. Mm -hmm. um, and I've taught, I also taught for several years uh, at a middle school that was designed for students that were expelled from other middle schools. So I taught, you know, that bad kid you had in the class? Well, that's the only kid I had in this class. They were all those bad kids. I said in quotes because they're not bad kids, but I had them all. And, um, and of course, I did teach alternative high school, which was probably one of my favorite jobs. So what is alternative I, high school? Um, it was an alternative program that was designed for students who, um, you know, for one reason or another, couldn't complete traditional diploma. And mm -hmm. they found their way. And, you know, some of them had been in out of jail. Some had, 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 you know, had been pregnant. You know, there's people that life took in different directions. And our program was set up to sort of, you know, give them a, another shot. And it was, a, it, was, it was a diploma program. So, and... Uh, it was a night. It was a night program. So, wow, that's that's an amazing span of uh, kids that you've taught, as well as adults. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, when you first started out, did you have the intention of of doing this, of of being so eclectic about who you would be teaching over the years, or did this just kind of happen? Okay. You know. I, I don't just I just could not have I could not have designed this it, it would just kind of happen to be honest mm -hmm. um, it just happened uh, but at the same time I always knew I'd be a teacher in the same way that I always knew I'd be a writer <clears throat> I kind of always knew that I wanted to be both mm -hmm. uh, so it's not surprising that I wound up doing this but yeah, I I, I I don't know like the college thing too. I mean, geez, I'm I, I'm could not be luckier than I am now. Uh, I am actually right now in this time. I'm I love my job, and I've been there for almost six years. I've never been happier anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I just mentioned that because uh, because of many of the students I I you know that I work with come from the same district I taught in, and this is hilarious. I think maybe five or six students I've had in that. In my courses, I had in middle school, and I didn't recognize them because they were small and then they were tall. I looked somewhat the same, so they recognized me. And almost all of them said, oh, man, "Sorry, Mr. Lawrence." They were they were uh, apologizing, and I said, "No, no, no. That's what I signed up for. It's okay." And so it's uh, they're, they're much nicer at the age of twenty than they were at fourteen. Just saying. Yeah, well, I think that's true of most people. Um, yeah. You know, we require a lot of patience and understanding when we're learning how to not behave like dicks, which is what uh, growing up is to a large extent. Um, what's interesting to me also is, has all this teaching you've done been in the same area, in the same state, or have you been all over the country? Uh, I, I had to sort of think about that, though, because uh, I've done so many Zooms in the past couple of years, you know, so I, I guess, yeah, I suppose really formal teaching, I, I believe only in Massachusetts. Yeah, the same state. Mm -hmm. And mostly in the same city. Yeah. Although wow. I tried to get it, I, I tried to get a New York teaching fellowship back in the late 90s mm -hmm. um, in New York um, City, um, but I didn't get it. So I had to come back. Interesting. So how is all this teaching giving you a perspective about what goes on in Boston and what the, cult the culture of Boston is like. That's interesting. Um, well, there's a lot to that because Boston is a very, it, it really is a, a metropolitan city. You know, it is a known, I think most people in the world who, who English speaking know where Boston is, right? It's a pretty, yeah. And a lot of people come here, and it has a lot of industries. I think the number one industry is a is, uh, medical in the medical industry, followed by um, education. We have upwards of, I mean, I'm sure we have by now over a hundred colleges and universities and higher institutions, and you know, there's just so many. Um, and uh, then, of course, there's, there's the tourism industry. So we have obviously a very diverse community as well, right? And, uh, of course, you, I'm sure you know this, but Boston is known as being 
um, somewhat compartmentalized. There are compartments of subcultures in certain places. And, and I think part of it is the geography, actually. Mm -hmm. There are certain, you know, subway lines that run and sort of cut this way and kind of create like a parcel, right? And then different subcultures coalesce in a, you know, into these sort of different boroughs. And so when you say the community or the culture of Boston, it's really uh, hard to nail that at this point. It might have been easier in 1974. Yeah, yeah, I can but, imagine. But but because of what I because of I've taught in that district, I have, and because I taught in so many different time uh, kinds of teaching contexts. I didn't mention that I taught in, in pilot schools or that I've substituted in charter schools um, uh, or summer programs that uh, at very wealthy programs uh, that contributed to um, the language is changing too. At the times they would say students at risk, but we, we that's, that we're sort of transitioning from using at risk youth, right? So you can say student, students of lesser means you know, there are different ways of describing, um, but I... Is that because the term at risk sounds like a shorthand for future criminal? I think so, you know, yeah. I, I can't, you know, I don't, I don't I, there's not a lot of conversation about that. It's just, a, it's, I don't think it's a controversial thing right now, but it's just, the language is, I think, softening. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's good. Mm -hmm. um, but I mentioned all this because None of this is abstract to me. And when we talk about um, education um, and certain um, debates that are being had about how to reach students and how to educate our citizenry, um, I just feel fortunate that I know these young people, and not just young people, but people, their families, their mothers, right? I went, I've gone to funerals of students and I sat there with them and, and then ate with them afterwards, you see? like. Or, or a graduation party, um, or just tutoring a student. Um, there's, there's, you, you form relationships, you know, with their families, not just the students, right? And um, and and uh, the, when you again going back to the question of culture, I mean, what culture? Which one? <laughs> just so many. Yeah. And there's a lot there too. Uh, we can get into later on. I'll simply mention though, when I say advanced advanced work students, that is a controversial. Uh, uh, subject right now. Um, in fact, in, in the city of Boston, they are talking about eliminating all advanced work programs and eliminating um, other other things. I think gifted and talented programs as well. Oh wow! Um, because they feel that that it it um, will help to uh, raise equity. You know, they want to create a more equitable uh, approach. To yeah, this is this is a very difficult, fascinating issue. Um, the gifted and talented program. I was in a lot of these as a kid myself and I had quite negative experiences of them, but maybe you've had more positive experiences. What's your experience been either teaching or being in gifted and talented programs? Well, I, I was never in a gifted and talented program, although I was, a, I was artistic as a young person, um, you know, I, uh, but I wasn't in it, um, but I've taught advanced work students so I worked with them in a reading and writing courses. Uh, and I can't say, let me, put in a, let me reframe that. I can say that it was very rewarding to work with students who were so, um, they were just so driven to learn and they were so agentive. They had such agency and they had such a sense of, this is my world. Well, this is our world. We're going to be journalists. We're going to learn this. We're going to learn that. We're going to create a student newspaper. We're going to make this work, make that work. And, and there was a real sense of, um, I'm, going to try, I'm trying to find a word that doesn't sound, um, I, I want to use the word entitlement, but that's not what I mean to say, because I know that- that Do you mean something like they were grown ups before their time? Um, I mean that they, I, I feel like they have uh, advantaged lives that, they grew, it was so, so clear that the discourse, you, you, I'm going to use a lot of educational jargon, but I'm going to fine, it's fine. Make, it, make it sound normal too. So in the education circles, we talk about discourse communities. And, um, and uh, the students that I taught were, well, 100% white. That's a fact. Inside, okay. just going to put it out there. I mean, it's the truth. It's, it's just the way it kind of worked out. 
Um, maybe one time there was one student of color, but for the most part, that wasn't true. And, and, and then around all that is a sea of students of color who did not somehow test into these programs. And I have then, you know, so I, I taught them as well. And I enjoyed them for, for different reasons. Um, there, are, you know, there are different subcultures that I had access to, you know, to learning about. And the advanced work students um, were really fun to, to, to teach because they came in with, you just knew that they spoke the discourse of what's called academic English. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be called more, more often used to be called standard American English. And now we're moving towards yet a new language, which is the language of wider communication, LWC, which mm -hmm. I prefer, um, which I'd love to talk about down the road um, in regards to um, Eric Smith uh, work. He's mm -hmm. a wonderful uh, professor of rhetoric and he's the one that introduced me to the idea of language of wider communication. What but is point, language of wider communication? Um, so, okay, so language of wider communication, it's basically what we're speaking right now. Okay. Um, and and it's a, it, it sounds, I suppose it probably doesn't sound very sincere. It sounds like yet another, oh, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a, but what makes it helpful is that it's sort of, it, does, it is inclusive to call it that because it's, it, it refers to a reality. It is in fact a widely spoken discourse, whatever this is, right? I know I, I'm not afraid of saying English. Yes, it's English, mm -hmm. but calling it the, wider, the, the language of wider communication, it leaves room for the um, contributions of other cultures and other languages to this language of wider communication, LWC, right? So, you, so we're gonna be using somewhere during this dialogue, I'm sure we're gonna be throwing in some words that are French, or you know that might have been come that came from the Franks, you know, or mm -hmm. from the German and whatnot. Thursday comes from the uh, from the Danes, right? So all that stuff. Anyway, I feel um, like so, deja vu. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, so to complete that thought, um, the and this is where and this is where privilege theory is not completely off. I mean, there is they came in the, the advanced work students will come in. And they have been saturated in the world of academic English and the discourse of standard American English or the mastery of the language of wider communication, however we want to say it. They, their, parent, their parents absolutely were able to afford after school programs and special out, outings to other countries, probably, certainly extra tutoring. So there's that. Um, yeah. So that was the. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, I mean, one of the things that this really brings up, which I haven't thought about, um, is although I'm very much on board with you in critiquing equity and all that kind of stuff, as you know, mm -hmm. um, but one thing I'm, I'm quite ambivalent about, just having thought about it because of my own experiences, is the gifted and talented program. I'm curious what you think of some of these ambivalences. Um, for instance, I remember being in these programs and initially thinking this is going to be a group of people I'm involved with that are much more intellectual than the other kids, maybe much more creative, much more worldly, much more like adults of the sort that I would like to hang out with if I could hang out with adults, but I couldn't because I was 10 years old. Um, and I remember thinking after I was in the program, no, that's not what's going on here. These people are competitive. They want to get better grades than everybody else. They want to be seen as more compliant and more hardworking than everybody else. And I remember thinking that learning is not the sort of thing you should be competitive about, that it's fundamentally stupid to try and be competitive about learning. It's better to be competitive about things that you actually do once you've learned stuff. But learning itself, to be competitive about that, to try and give yourself a kind of better start in life always kind of struck me as shallow, the same way that it sort of strikes me as shallow to try and be more beautiful than other people or something like that. I was curious what you think about that. Yeah, um, yeah, huh. I mean, I already, I already agree with you. Uh, I think learning should be a collaborative effort. I, I think, uh, and I, and myself, um, I, I learn in concert, I really do. I'm a dialogical just by nature, you know, I. This is my first actual podcast where I'm featured. So 
I didn't even know what this would be. And I just thought, well, Steve, just be yourself. Just yeah, let you're it doing be. great. Let it let it do its thing. And that's how I teach as well. I mean, I do, of course, I have, you know, a curriculum that's designed, but a lot of it is Socratic and by nature. Mm -hmm. um, I know you know a lot about that. Post-Socratic, you might even call it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's really, um, uh, and, and so it's wonderful to me. And I, I, I really, I, I actually sometimes feel, I actually have a name for it, synapt, uh, synaptic collegiality. Oh, that's interesting. Isn't that beautiful? I, I actually came up with that phrase when I, when I did my, my master's thesis on educating, uh, education. And I had this amazing uh, mentor who was a literacy coach who later helped me build a faculty senate in a major, uh, in a large middle school, a uh, K-8 school in Boston. Uh, but he, he I, I talked, he, he reminded, he, he's got me to think of that phrase because he also is dialogical by nature, but he's also very brilliant. But then I, the idea sort of developed over time and I realized that's what I want to do in my classroom. And it's actually, I think it actually happens naturally. And uh, so there's that. And so, so yeah, why would I want to walk away with you feeling smaller than me? What would I, what, 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 what did you get, what do you, what do you get out of that? I don't want yeah, it, It's uh, silly actually. Yeah. And I see a lot of that online too. Uh, there's a woof, talk about competition. Totally. Only online, it, it, if you're, if you're talking to people on a certain side of the political spectrum, they just want you to feel like you're dumb. Um, and over here, they want you to feel like you're evil. And so it's still competitive though. It's not learning together. We're not growing or evolving and discovering. It's just, so I hear you. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, in my experience, the, the right, when you disagree with them, they either want you to feel dumb or they troll you. Yeah. And the left, when you disagree with them, want you to feel like you're evil and you, you should belong in jail. <laughs> yeah, you're a bad person. Yeah. Very, you're very bad. How dare you? Shame on you. You're mm -hmm. a very bad person. Oh, yeah. Bad. Sometimes worse than that. Yeah. Right. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, but, I actually, um, well, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that sometime. So keep going. <laughs> so one of the things that you've, you've mentioned um, is that your current group of students that you teach now are largely students of color. Yeah. As opposed to the talented, gifted students that were mostly white, right? Yes. Well, I don't want to emphasize that, that other, those other group of students though, or, or that experience. That was just one class I taught out of many, over many years. Okay. I'm simply, I, I simply noted that because you were asking me a question about the culture of Boston, and I wanted to name all the different subcultures that I've had the advantage of getting to know in a pretty intimate way. Um, so I just wanted to just kind of, kind of put, put that framing in, a, in its proper place. Okay. In my college, right? I, uh, it's the college itself is seventy four percent students of color. Um, in my classes, uh, there are many who are. It's a large number of students who are. It's a larger percentage usually. Sometimes it's 100%. Um, and, and part of the reason is that I'm teaching in the humanities uh, and um, I'm not sure actually quite, but that's the way it worked out. Um, oh, I see, give me some, I just realized. A lot of my students are English language learners. Oh, I see. Um, and so that I was trying to figure out where I was, where I was going with that. So the, the, it makes perfect sense why I would have a larger um, percentage of students of color in my you know, classes, even larger percentage in the college, um, because I'm teaching a lot of students who are immigrants. They're either immigrants or they are, um, they, they, again, they, they grew up in households that don't speak the language of water communication in the same way. The discourse community that they're coming in with is wonderful in and of itself. It, they just need a little more practice in developing this discourse, the one that's going to help them be prepared to get their degrees in technology and to get out there and become captains of industry. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, and it's fascinating. Um, I'm actually working with a student from Ethiopia who speaks Amharic. And I'll show you something real quick. Uh, this is called a mouth puppet. Mm. Yeah, and you use the mouth puppet. And what you do is you, you quite literally teach students, um, uh, a lot of English language learners, and, and that, that would be us too. If I was a Spanish language learner, which I was, and I still am, uh, there are certain, phenomes or phonemic sounds I simply cannot after all these years I still can't roll my R's garro I guess and um student there there so I work with a student I tutor him about an hour and a half every week for two sessions outside of class time and um we we go through lists of consonants and vowels and I literally will teach him train him how to 
literally, you, you know, how do you make an R sound? You, you curl the tongue, you roll it back. That's called phonemic awareness. Um, and he's rapidly advancing because we're doing a systematic instruction in phonemic awareness and then syllabication, breaking words in the syllables, and then there's all kinds of things. Um, so uh, that's just one student, and that's very different from the working class military uh, veteran I, I also have uh, in the other class, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, so it's a really, it's a very rich uh, teaching uh, scenario for sure. So how do you deal with the problem of some students trying very hard just to keep up with what you're saying, and other yeah. students feeling like this guy is speaking really slowly, you know, to accommodate students who don't speak English? How do you get a balance right? I literally just finished an ESL program I designed. I, I designed a curriculum, uh, a co-designed, um, but I, I, the part that I fully designed is the actual ESL, ESOL, they call it now, English Speakers of Other Languages. We call them ESOLs now. There's mm -hmm. a lot of reasons for that. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's like, you really do have to, there are many strategies that you can use, that you have to use, and one of them is yes, speaking slowly, right? But also, um, for a small a small example is you know if I, the more I learn to see things from the eyes of the student. So for, if I say to you, um, you know, what, you, you want to read, you know, left to right, you could just saw my hand, but my hand is actually moving right to left. But I've, I'm trained and moving it from your perspective. So when I say right to left, I mean sorry, when I say left to right, I know. I now can do that, and I know it was going to be helpful for you, as an English language learner, or even just a regular person, a rest ended English speaker. Um, so, uh, visual aids are, are obviously, you know, and oftentimes, in the, we, when I teach on Zoom, I'll just go ahead and type a word in the chat window so they can read it as I say it, and I do it the entire session. I'll just throw words in and I'll type them. Uh, and that's good for, and, and I'll also do this. Uh, this is not, by the way, these are not just my techniques. These are things I was trained in, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, well, okay, so I'll throw a word in, like um, I said something earlier, I said synaptic collegiality, and I might just say collaborative thinking. I might throw that in there and I'll say them both next to each other so that you will see that they're similar. And that there's, a, there's a name for that technique, I forget what it is, but the idea is that you, you're introducing synonyms without teaching about synonyms. And you're expanding their vocabulary, which means you're also expanding the potential to, uh, for them to make synaptic connections you know, between ideas, which of course, as we know, especially for young people, a lot of my students are still young, they're between anywhere from 17 to 25, some of them, of course, in their 40s. Um, but most of them, though, are the age where their um, their frontal cortex is literally still developing. The neuron, yeah. their neurons haven't even folded, right? So, and so, a lot of oh, this is exciting. A lot of what you're doing with English language learners, you're also. It's, I, I was, I was going to type in my chat window. So, um, it's called the principles of universal design, and the principles of universal design is basically you don't stand up at the front of a class and deliver a lecture and talk the whole time. You use multiple, I'm gonna use education jargons I told you earlier, multiple teaching modalities, right? Or pedagogies. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they'll even say multiple Englishes. That's another whole other, whole other thing. Um, and so you'll, uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do something where um, I'll pose a question uh, and, it'll, and I'll let the space be uncomfortable, pause, let it sit, let the uncomfort be there. And what's, um, what's uncomfortable is that th they want me to do something, but I want, I don't want, no, no, I want you to do something. I want you to grasp, I want you to grapple this question I have raised. And then eventually someone fills it in, someone steps in. And then, um, so one of the things I do in the very beginning, I'm probably bouncing around a bit here. Um, there's a great book called Choice Words by Peter Johnston, and it's, it's actually about how to create a Socratic dialogue in the, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, now, in middle school and high school, the, uh, elementary, middle, and high school, and in public school teaching, there's actually a name for it. They call it accountable talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I, prefer the, I prefer the name Socratic dialogue. Accountable talk sounds almost punitive. But it'll, it does, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I, you're right, right. So, but here's a beautiful thing, right? Um, so I'll I have a whole list of phrases, which I, I, I now call, I forget, I, I, I used to call it accountable talk, and then I called it prompts for academic inquiry. Now I call it prompts for Socratic dialogue. 
So, and how to, how to, how to begin a conversation is one section. How to um, respond to others, how to acknowledge what someone else has just said, how to wrap it up, right? And I took several of those prompts from the book Choice Words by Peter Johnston, which are wonderful. And then I added a bunch from my own experiences. So for here's an example. What may, how did you arrive at that conclusion, Juan? And so it seems to you and me, well, duh, right? But for a young person to be kind of trained in asking a question like that, you're training them in intellectual respect, into epistemic humility, actually, come to think of it. Yes. Um, I'll, even this, I'll say something like, thank you, um, Arabella. I never thought of it that way before. I actually have that typed up as one part of the list. And I'll say to them, you don't need to read these exactly the way. That's cheesy and fake. But try them out for a bit, you know, and then find your own way, right? You don't have to say, what made you arrive at that interpretation, you know, but you, but certainly is a good idea to be curious about why someone thinks rather than jump down there, you know, jump on them or ignore them. And so once we learn those techniques, it really is absolutely delightful to see it. It just, this, this climate of curiosity really does kind of coalesce over time, almost effortlessly, just by introducing the inquiry-based sort of culture. So I go back, going back to your question about teaching ELLs, English language learners, that's a wonderful way for them to develop competency and strength of confidence, really, in mastering the English language. You have to give them the opportunity to talk. You know, right now, what I'm doing with right now is not what I usually do in the classroom. I've spoke a lot just now. And I do that sometimes, you know, because I know some stuff and I want to throw it away. But it really is, it has to be a student-generated discourse if it's going to be powerful and effective. And they call it the universal, the principles of universal design because it, you can actually use strategies for teaching English language learners. Mm -hmm. You can use those strategies. And if you're doing those strategies for ELLs, you're going to reach the other students too. They also benefit from that multiple modalities of teaching. So you'll show like a, a YouTube video, but he won't show the entire, you don't show it 45 minutes and go and call your mom, right? That's not teaching. That's bad teaching, actually. Everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. But you show it and you, and you say to the students three times during the viewing of this YouTube video, um, I'm, I'm going to ask us to pause. And when you pause, I'd like you to pose. I, I'd, like, I'd like it because you had, you had a question that came up for you, a confusion mm -hmm. that you wanted to clear up, or an observation that you felt might you know, uh, contribute to our, our, you, our theme that we're studying today. And that's exciting. Um, you know, it just is. It, it, it's very, again, I'm using the word, again, teaching jargon, but the, the, a word that we use sometimes is agentive, which of course, no one, no normal people says agentive, but we all know it means agency. And you want them to feel that sense of agency and can do. So you give me opportunities. And mm. so, yeah. That's interesting. So when you were growing up, presumably you had your fair share of good teachers that were very inspirational to you. Mm. Did you have any bad teachers? Yes. And what, did, what sorts of things did they do that as a teacher now you think I'll never do that? Oh, I, I, you know, this is so funny. I have to think about this for a moment. I mean, I have been pondering for a very long time how much I'm willing to speak publicly about, you know, how much am I willing to sort of um, share about my own experiences, right? Because it's in this day and age, it's just, you know. Yeah, you don't have to name them. You don't have to name yeah, them. Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, and there's nothing controversial. I, I, what, what I mean, though, is like, it, it's like you don't, you don't want to freeze something. It becomes frozen. And then, it, you know, so I don't want to um, share it too much detail because I don't want to, I want to get that, that teacher, those teachers a break, you know, let them get it. You know what I mean? Um, but I'll tell you this one teacher, she, she comes to my mind. Um, it was a teacher who I didn't have, but was a sister of a teacher I had. And um, I was in a play in, in school and, and I was a teenager. And I was very sensitive. I mean, and I don't mean that I was a weepy crybaby. I was actually very obnoxious, actually, more than anything else. But, but I still had a sensitivity, right? Let teenagers do. Mm -hmm. And she said the meanest thing to me. I mean, of course, you would blank, Steve. You always blank. It didn't matter what uh, the blank was. Mm -hmm. It was such a totalizing frame 
to capture me in. And it was so mean and negative and so like shame shaming, like like hundred percent as if that was all I was, was this bad thing that she felt that I was. And it was such a comment and it was really just, and I have to admit, I cried. I did, and I, it was kind of devastating and I didn't want to go on stage. Uh, and I did eventually, uh, and a person talked me down and I felt better and I got over it. And you know, but then again, you can't, adolescents are also, you can't really, this is really recent too, but was I correct? Maybe not, maybe she was right, you know? I have also been a teacher who, I've had meetings with students when they broke down because we were concerned about their behavior. So, hey, an adolescent cried in my presence too when I was a teacher, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, but I hope I never intentionally make a student feel like they're lower or bad, or I, I guess I just, it, it's the ones that you just, you can just tell that they hate you or they dislike you. The ones that sneer when you come into the room, um, I have a hard time with them. And I had a hard time with them as a colleague. I'd seen it, I'd seen it. And I don't like it at all. Um, let's see. I, uh, another teacher, let's see here. I, I do wanna talk about this because it's something I really, I'm writing about. It's so important, frankly. Um, I actually had so many good teachers. I'm very, again, I'm very lucky. I just did. Um, gosh, I really did. Gosh, yeah. I mean, there's one teacher, Miss uh, Miss L. I'll call Miss L. Home economics, and she just couldn't stand me. But I was 12. You wouldn't have been able to stand me either. Even my friends couldn't stand me. Um, but you can't let the kid know that. You know, you, you got to give them some room to be a mess, a hot mess, when they're teenagers. You know, when they're young, you got to let them be just people. And I feel that adults. Sometimes, uh, this is so funny, I'm sounding like such a leftist, and now I know, and I am really. I mean, and in fact, I, I've been talking about this. My orientation is, uh, uh, I am oriented in that touchy-feely thing, you know, like, uh, which they used to call it that, or what do they call it now? Um, uh, what's that word looking for? I forget the pejoratives that people use for liberals. Weepy liberals uh, cried. No, what's that? Think, what's that? Yeah, I think maybe what you're what you're getting at is you you oh. like to accommodate. Yeah, oh, sensitivity yeah. and the yes. inability right. to accomplish a goal, rather yeah. than put a clear line in the sand and say you either do this or you fail, and if you failed, it's your fault. Fuck off. Right. Yeah. Got me. That's exactly it. Boy, this is going to be a fun conversation because I can also say it's not me. I'm stuck on the word. I'm trying to find the, the word that's normal. What are they, they it, it's an old phrase that people used to use about liber liberals. I, I don't want to fetishize the word liberal, but. Is your natural word? orientation um, yeah. close to, but not quite snowflakeism? Right, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm snowflake adjacent. Yeah, snowflake, that's a great way of putting it. Snowflake. I really am though. You know, you wouldn't know it. I'm online saying, you know, critiquing the far left stuff sometimes, but, but, you know, I am snowflake adjacent. Well, yeah. that's, I, well, I think that makes sense because the far left is not in any way compassionate or forgiving. No. Towards its, its enemies. Nice. It's more hard on them than the right is towards people who mess up. Yes. But yeah, I know your natural inclination which I can relate to, yeah, is is to walk into a classroom. I mean, this is my own experience when I taught philosophy between I think it was two thousand eight and thirteen. I taught college because I was in college as a grad student, and they let me teach at Nottingham University. And my attitude towards my students was always, "I'm here to help you perform for me." That may be somewhat of a paradox. It's complicated. There's obviously stuff you're responsible for that you have to do that I can't do for you. But my job is to help you to the best ability that I can to help you do that stuff. And if you feel unconfident or like you can't understand something or you can't master a skill set, come to me, ask me any question. Use me as much as you can to help you. Because that's what I'm here for. That's what I would do. And I would always get great student feedback having you know done that approach um, throughout all those years. But I got a sense from my colleagues that they didn't like that so much. They wanted me to be much more hardline with students. 
And I remember there were some people who I won't name who suggested things to me like, well, if you, if you feel that you're teaching a seminar and there's a student that didn't understand the material enough to finish reading it, kick them out, you know, do a bit of humiliation so that they learn that they can't come back to that seminar unless they've read that material and tried their hardest to understand it and really communicate the message that if you don't perform for me, there's gonna be psychological humiliation involved, which is the exact opposite of what I was trying to do, which was say, okay, we're gonna have as minimal humiliation as possible and consider me your assistant in helping you perform. Now, in the years since I've taught, if I were to teach again in that same situation, maybe I would be a bit more hard line now than I was then because I was super lefty and super compassionate then in ways that I'm a bit more critical of now because I've seen some of the consequences of kind of leftism run amok in education. But I still think basically my inclination as a teacher is to not be a hard ass. Yeah, yeah, um, I hear you. I love just hearing you talk just makes me happy. You know, I, I enjoy this. I just even hearing you speak of it and it just made me think again how lucky I am to be in this career. I really am, and it's such a, and it's a, it's like, and why would you want to humiliate? I mean, it's just, in fact, there's a whole other area of study called human dignity and humiliation studies. Mm -hmm. It hasn't really kicked off very much. I think it, I think it's associated with Columbia University, and I don't remember who came up with this term. I just know who who popularized it for me. There's this man named David Yamada. David Yamada is um, the author of the Healthy Workplace Bill. He's known as one of the 30 most influential organizational psychologists in the, in the world, according to, I think, Forbes or some other magazine about three or four years ago. He's actually not an organizational psychologist, but they put him in that list because he's so um, influential in, uh, in recognizing bullying behaviors, workplace bullying in particular. Uh, he's a brilliant uh, thinker, and, he, and he's very much a compassionate person his orientation is, is very compassionate, uh, but he came up with the word uh, dignitarianism. Mm -hmm. And I thought, geez, that's just beautiful. And I am, I can honestly claim that, though I do love South Park, by the way. Um, I have, I love humor that's really wrong, but, but in my heart of hearts, I'm a dignitarian. And then it sounds like you are to some degree yourself. Uh, and that's the, the, digni the dignitarian approach to teaching isn't being nice all the time. It's about honoring the dignity in the other and sometimes honoring the dignity in the other takes the form of putting mm -hmm. limits on them right limits limits are important um and that's where we, i think we're, we're using the word leftism i'm going to try to find another way to put it uh i want to say that um safety culture safetyism has yeah. been it has it has taken what, what we have just spoken I, I don't know how long we've been talking but clearly by now it's my approach would be safetyism adjacent but I stopped short of safetyism. Um, and- That's uh, really interesting. Yeah, I really do and I must. Um, boy, so it's interesting. It's really interesting. And yet I'm the one who's designed this ESOL course that's gonna be you know, implemented most likely. Uh, and, and it is very much designed to accommodate in a thoughtful way, English language learners, not just linguistically, but these people are coming into a completely new culture. And in some ways now, let me just say that their nervous systems are going to be somewhat stressed because they're learning a language, they're trying to make it, who knows what to, you know, I'll put it this way. I wrote a, I wrote a letter for a student about five to six years ago, maybe, or, I don't know, somewhere in the, in the past few years. Um, it's the first letter that, that has been used in the official president's, uh, whatever you call it, from a, from a teacher um, uh, arguing for the, um, uh, political asylum for a student and uh, and we won got a student political asylum i had students tell me i mean they're, they're writing papers and and, and, and uh, they're writing papers and one of the first units of study in the classes that i teach um some of the classes we use the hero's journey right the, 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 the paradigm of the hero's journey now we, you know and it's interesting because boy uh talk about the hero's journey you know or ordinary world i'm in peru Right, or I'm in Colombia, um, or Ethiopia, whatnot, or 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 the Taliban just came into my town, and and all, all my many of my friends and cousins, their bodies are laying down the street. This is true. Ooh, I have some nice. students yeah. who are 
they got in a, you know they got in a truck uh they had a cousin who owned some some road that was not public but they were able to get out ahead of the taliban and now they're in my class writing about it and so and then you so the ordinary world right and then there's the call to adventure of course we all know adventures can be very dangerous and then there's the refusal of a call like oh i don't know i don't know uh, okay i'm gonna do it i'm gonna go to america and then you cross the threshold and then the next step in the hero's journey is a very long one tests allies and enemies right mm -hmm. and what and sometimes the enemy is just that you can't get your immunization uh shots because you didn't get your documentation and sometimes the enemy is just this simple obstacle of not being able to teach english or the frustration with having a teacher like me you know who maybe talks too fast or you know whatever it is you know and so uh going back to uh, i think we we're talking about safetyism uh it i ah, gosh so interesting and see again i'm coming from the snowflake you know this mm -hmm. is this is my orientation the uh, the, the compassionate uh orientation is the is the ground and um and yet I immediately don't, I do, I do, I, I'm reluctant to use the word trauma because that word has been bastardized, corrupted, exaggerated, and laugh. Honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a word that makes me cringe now. I almost wanted to say that the nervous systems of English language learners, some of them, one could say that there's a little bit of a traumatization going on when it's getting repeatedly stomped on from a really harsh kind of world. And I want to accommodate that in the, in the classes in a respectful way, but not by creating an overly hyper vigilant space, mm -hmm. not by redo getting rid of all standards, right? Not by um, I hate again. I don't want to use the word coddling, but I'm going to use the word coddling. We don't want to go there either, you know. So it's a very um, it's a very it's a very subtle dynamic process of balancing. You know, the, 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 the sort of uh, the sensitivity. Oh, I know what's going to say now. Uh, right. So in the, I'm in the process also of, because uh, I'm the, uh, I'm now a committee chair of the faculty development committee, right? So I'm responsible for bringing in the training for all of the staff and the faculty. I'm responsible for facilitating it. It's not me that does it, right? We all work together. But um, I'm bringing in a person who was going to help us learn how to create trauma informed environments. Mm -hmm. Right, um, trauma-informed environments. When I was in middle school, in two schools, I was really active uh, as a as a what they what they call teacher leadership is what they call it in the K to twelve world teacher leadership. Um, and what I wound up being a big part of was I, I I drafted a bully prevention plan and worked with the parent council, school site council, senate, students, you know. And so there there's always been that that's always been the light motif or the background sort of commitment that I've always had as an educator uh, is uh, to create classrooms that are, again, trauma informed. And they're and also hopefully, you know, the, the, the larger school culture. But as you know, and this is what Nick Haslan, I'm sure you've heard of him, Nick Haslan in 2016, as a psychologist who published a paper uh, on what he called concept creep. Yes. And so now the idea, so the pro, so so all the things I just said, I'm not going to now suddenly say I'm not for those things anymore. I absolutely am still absolutely yes, you got it. I'm in there. I'm with it. I'm with you, right, students. But the concept creep problem is that the, the boundaries of what trauma means, bullying means, mental abuse means, abuse means, mental uh, uh, mental illness, um, racism, bigotry, misogyny. These, 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 what used to be definitional territories, they have become so amorphous and expansive beyond, it's almost impossible to uh, not, uh, uh, it's impossible. I, I, I read this line in a movie once, and I don't know who said it, it's wonderful. Um, and it was, a, it was a male character, and, and he was a tough guy of some sorts. You cannot you cannot be in this world. You cannot live in this life. You cannot live a lifetime on this earth without crossing someone's line. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it's happened. We that is, and this is where the conservatives are not wrong about. You know, it, it's like you have to leave, realize that life really is a series of trade offs. Mm -hmm. you, you're just yeah. going to have to accept that at some point, either today or tomorrow, I'm I'm going to annoy somebody, 
I might just be in their way on the sidewalk or in a hurry. You're going to hurt their might, feelings. Right. I might not uh, pick up the phone if you call. I won't be able to. Maybe, uh, you know, I live, I live with an 86 year old woman. I'm a caregiver for her. I'm also a companion. And I left a note for her. I let her juice. I got her yogurt. I have her grapes. Everything's ready. The music, it's nice. But it's also, hey, just let you know, I'm not going to be here until two o'clock. You know, I'm going to be at a meeting. And that's usually we, we, we spend some time together around this time, right? But now she's going to get up. But hey, I've got classical music on, right? I've got the nice lighting. I got the heater next to where she likes to sit so she can be warm. And it's got this beautiful spread of food. But there's going to be uncomfort. This is going to oh, this is wonderful. I, I have to just throw this out. And we're talking now we're talking about anti-fragility. And it's very important. And now I bring it back to teaching, but I'm going to just for a moment talk about here. This woman who I love, like a second mother to me. Um, right. So we 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 want to be accommodating and we want to be empathic and compassionate. Um, but really, as we all know, part of compassion is uh, you have to also be live according to truth, however you define it. We also want to, part of what I have to say, I'm, 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 I'm getting up there in age now, I'm 52, and I have still yet to, I still cannot help but feel that life is going to have discomforts for the rest of my life, unpleasantness, pain, loneliness. I'm, I'm not going to get what I want a lot. You know, mm -hmm. um, and um, so that's being, I think becoming wise is, is sort of, it's wisdom to, 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 to expect pain mm -hmm. and to expect not getting what you want and to learn to be a little, a little, a little more anti-fragile. It's a Nassim Taleb, I think, what was that phrase? Anti-fragility? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't have to like me or respect me. You don't have to... Uh, um, admire me, and you don't even have to. I mean, you don't. Even, you you could even look at me in a bad way. You know, what am I going to do? And I'm not going to. For me to expect uh, you to anyone to. Uh, so I'm getting a bit lost there, but there seems to be. Uh, I think what uh, you're <laughs> describing is a real, genuine phenomenon of hyperfragility, not just in education, but it's everywhere. It's in popular culture, like for instance. I saw an article on Facebook the other day about Kristen Stewart, the actress, that was in a movie magazine or something like that. And it was an article about why she was a hero. So I clicked on it because I thought maybe she's given some money to people in Africa. Maybe she's adopted some homeless children. But the reason why she was a hero is because when she was on the red carpet, she walked for a bit with some high heels and then they were hurting her feet and she took them off. And she took some pictures with her high heels in her hands as opposed to on her feet. And she was described as a hero for this and a trailblazer for women. Fighting oppressive norms about how you must wear uncomfortable high heels on the red carpet. And I just thought, future generations are going to look at this and think, were these people fucking crazy? This is nuts. That's really interesting. You just brought in a whole other realm there. Um, now you're talking about, that's interesting, concept creep can also be applied to um, positive, what could should be positive values. So now be, it's heroic to take your shoes off, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, and I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I get it. You know, we can frame it as She's flouting the, 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 the cis heteronormativity, um, patriarchy customs by, okay. Uh, is it really heroic though? Come on. You know, heroic is when you're doing something that's really risky. If you are not putting yourself at risk, I mean, real risk. It's, you know, it is not, I love it when people come out. I mean, you're coming out as what and where and who's really gonna come after you for coming out as fill in the blank. No, no, everyone no. that comes out is bisexual these days and you're supposed to. Well, yeah, it's, it's like, it, it's sort of like, I don't know, it's fine. It's okay. You know, I, I try to make a, I also say to myself, Steve, you need to be a little, you, you, let people just let, you know, just let them, just shh. Uh, people going to people. Um, so, yeah. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly that you mentioned was kindness, uh, which I think is, is fascinating because 
Um, kindness is often used to get people to do things that reflect a certain ideology, like be kind. When it's not clear that what they're doing actually is kind, what's clear that what they're doing is doing what the ideology says they should do. Um, and there's a related word, which is also very interesting, which people use all the time, which I don't think people even think about the meaning of, and that's compassion. Mm -hmm. Compassion, as I understand it, is about letting people off the hook, about allowing people to fail to live up to a standard. And maybe there might even be good reasons for them to generally live up to that standard, but in this particular instance, being compassionate towards somebody means, okay, I would in general expect this of you. You didn't do what I wanted to do, but for whatever reason, it's okay. You're human. Like that to me is compassion. But the way that people use compassion now almost means like the exact opposite of that <laughs> when they're using it. It means live right. up to the standard. It doesn't mean it's okay for failing. Uh, you're saying that it's now means that it's, can you, I'm not sure I understand. What are you, you're saying that compassion nowadays means what? Compassion yeah. nowadays means there's a standard you must live up to in how you treat or think about or speak to others. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah Whereas compassion, about... I always thought was about saying it's okay to fail. It's okay to not live up to the rule everybody else has to live up to. You're human. Yeah. Okay. Wow. This There's a lot of desert a lot there. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. I mean, gosh, I mean, my, the first thing that comes to my mind uh, is the term idiot compassion, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you've heard. I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, it's, I think it's a Middle Eastern term. Um, well, actually, I haven't, so enlighten oh, okay. me. Okay. okay, so I first learned that phrase from uh, a spiritual teacher whose name is Gurdjieff, George Gurdjieff, who founded a, a school, I think it was called the, the School for the, the Institute for the Harmonious Development of man back in 1912 around there during that somewhere around the russian revolution he was a russian uh, turkish mystic um and uh and he talked about um idiot compassion and then i've heard it spoken by buddhist teachers ever since for many years so idiot compassion is um it's when you it's it's the, uh, to put it in simple terms it's when you give somebody a fish instead of teaching them to fish mm -hmm. real compassion is teach is teaching them how to fish Real compassion is, is, is saying, you know, you might want to go to this pond in August because this is when the flounder, you know, finds its way. This is where they're mating. You can find all kinds of babies, whatever. I'm not good at fishing, so I probably just made something mm -hmm. up that was enough. Um, but you, 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 you give them the ins and outs. You show them the mechanics of success in this very particular way. And that is compassionate because you're then, you know, it's the thing and that, that person then has agency. And it's empowerment. Oh, this is gorgeous. I, and that's why I'm writing about is teaching based on the principle of empowerment is so much more powerful than teaching on the basis of you're frightened and timid and I'm supposed to protect you. This yeah. is interesting. Um, okay. oh, you're absolutely, gosh. this is a really interesting issue that you're illuminating. Um, I actually think what you've just described um, implies that we shouldn't be compassionate all the time. Because oh. if compassion is about letting people fail and saying it's okay, um, there has to be a lot of time when you don't say it's okay to fail. And that means that in order to, to teach people to look out for their best interest, even to love them successfully, there are numerous points in which the compassion has to stop. Now, I'm not, an, I, I try to avoid being an ideological totalist myself, but I can be, I can be dogmatic. And I almost want to tell you you're wrong and tell you why. And I'm having fun here. Um, I, I, I can tell you that, yes. In, in that, and, and so look, hearing you speak and, you, and going along with that, uh, I, know that I, I know that we are in agreement. We just are on this matter. It's mm -hmm. the framing that I'll simply put out that, that, that just because um, it's interesting how we can frame it differently. One could also say that one should always be compassionate at all times. And let's, we want to go to the concept creep? Good, let's do, let's do it here too. Let's expand compassion. Well, why, don't, why don't we have compassion will include moments like not 
you know, letting them fail is actually the compassionate thing to do. Um, and the Buddhists actually have a whole like epistemology around that and a moral, and a moral framework. Uh, what, do you, yeah. what do you philosophers call it? Is it eschatology or soteriology? You know, what's the, the fancy philosophical term for morality in a, in a, in a spiritual or religious ethos? Teaching? Maybe. Ethos. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So ethos. So um, there's actually uh, in the, the, the Buddha, the Shakyamuni, the historical, he was actually a real person. He lived 2,500 years ago in a very specific, you know, area of India. Uh, and uh, he was part of the Shakya clan. So we call him Shakya Muni Buddha. Uh, and his, uh, I think Siddhartha was his first name. I'm not good at like actual history. So, but he, he um, when he proclaimed the, what he called the Dharma, which is Sanskrit for truth, uh, or the Buddha Dharma, which is a collection of teachings, uh, he came up with what's called the Four Noble Truths. Right. Uh, the first noble truth is all conditioned life is suffering. And the three noble truths that follow from that, from that first one is, uh, well, I forget exactly what they're called now. How funny, um, you know, that, that the suffering is caused by self cherishing and self narcissism, essentially. Mm -hmm. And there's a way out of suffering. And the fourth noble truth is that here's a way out of suffering. And, and part of that fourth noble truth, it, it, it sort of opens up into, um, uh, like I think it's eight practices. So right speech, right thought, right action, uh, right livelihood. Um, I'm not proclaiming that we're all supposed to be Buddhist now. I'm simply noting that. Oh, but and of course I did get my, I, I, I myself did take um, Buddhist vows uh, at the age of 20, 28. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my Buddhist name is, is actually Sanjay Bang, which is a uh, Tibetan for Buddha servant. Um, so I'm not uh, so anything I'm saying right now, take with a grain of salt. A lot of um, my friends are Buddhists. Yeah, um, I'm not a, but I'm not. I I, I follow out of a path right now. Um, and but I uh, I'm still informed somewhat by basic Buddhist ethics. And um, so right action, right, is you. There are, there are several ways. Uh, that's in, in Tibetan Buddhism, they call it the four karmas, right? Pacifying, enriching, magnifying, and just um, pacifying, enriching magnetizing and destroying so there are moments where the, the appropriate action the appropriate response we can which you can really only know intuitively if you're not overly conceptualizing that's the basic path of mindfulness is that you'll know when to pacify when to be gentle when to maybe let let the person freak out knowing that you can't control that as long as they're hurting anyone just let them freak out but it'll smooth out eventually like the, let the toddler scream and stomp right you don't always want to run to the toddler who's stopping and screaming during that that phase of development it's actually better not to right at certain points um uh magnetizing is sort of like um not a manipulative i don't mean sneaky deceptive i mean that one puts out an energy of welcome an energy of respectfulness and like it's like you're putting a welcome uh, an energy of welcome and welcomeness you know in being invitational in your basic approach in your presence and um, and uh, pacifying, of course, it's, that's easy, you, you know. But 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 destroying is a karma, which is again action. It means action in Sanskrit. It's one of the right actions. Um, destroying means that you actually do not participate in negative behavior, and you don't allow negative behaviors that could hurt yourself or others. You don't make room for it, or you extinguish it. Now, real quick, when it comes to teaching actual educators, regular education. There's actually a practice that we learn in, in our graduate program programs called extinguishment, extinguishing. It might come from behavioral psychology. It's when you, um, it's also called planned ignoring, where a student is trying to get attention, especially in middle school age, you know, they're, they're being disrupted or they're calling your name out or they're whatever, they're doing something that's intentionally designed to get a, to get a, you know, to get a rise out of you, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so what you do is called, it's called planned ignoring. You, you, you move your body away, right? And, and you pretend not to hear them and you just let them extinguish, let that agitational energy extinguish itself. And that is a, 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 a right action of destroying. You're destroying what's considered untruth in that moment or unkindness. Um, and it reminds me of something else, if I could just give an example. That's why I love teaching because it, I can bring all of this into, the, into my world as an educator. It's like, and it's not even me being the leader, the teacher, the man who knows. It's not, it's very democratic. In a sense that all I'm doing, I guess I just get to flow with mm -hmm. these people. So 
one another um, right action, and I hope I'm not going off on too much of a rail here, is um, so I'll give an example of a student. He, he was so agitated and angry, and this was at a school that was set up for, 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 for young people who were expelled from other schools. So these were not easy people to work with, right? Mm -hmm. And I just somehow knew um, well, how to work with him. I'll call him, um, I'll call him Bob, because I've never had a student named Bob. Mm -hmm. um, his, his name was Bob, okay, we'll call him Bob. Bob was from a really tough neighborhood in Boston called um, Dorchester, but this part of Dorchester is called Mattapan which the kids themselves, I'm, I'm using their language, they called it the hood, okay? That's the language they used. And it wasn't a pejorative, they, it was the hood according to them. And he really was seriously involved in some serious gang stuff. His best friend had just been killed by a gun just weeks earlier. He wrote poems about it in my, in my, in my English language arts class. I think about Bob a lot because I've run into him several times over the years. That's a story I wanna tell. I'm going to, I'm certainly gonna be writing about it. But anyway, he was so, so over the top and destructive. And so when I walk, I know I'm doing this a lot physically, I'm kind of showing you already what I was, what I was going to tell you. So I said, hey, you know, hey, hey, Bob, you know, can we, let, let's, let's step up for a minute. And then, yeah, 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 right. So he steps out. He's like 14 at this age at this point. Mm -hmm. And he is, you know, I, I, I would not want to mess with him. I would not. Um, and I just stood next to him. And we and I just we just looked across the hallway when there was this bunch of stuff on the walls, nothing in the board. And I just paused and I, and I and I lowered my voice and I just said, What happened in there? And that's it. And so that that one could one could say that that's the right action of pacifying. You're 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 look, you're gentling, you're gentle, I call it gentilizing, you're gentilizing your voice. You're you're not confrontational you're not know, like looking at them direct like that and you just ask and then you you know what let it be long let the pause be as long as it wants to be let him just be a human being and and it is i forget what his answer was it was, it was like this is like one of the billions of times that some middle schooler freaked out in my classroom right um but i don't remember what he had to say i just know that it was important that he said it Something pissed him off in there, and you know, kids are nasty, right? He was the kid was so traumatized by, by what was going on in his life, and um, uh, I got to tell you, man. And I'm gonna—I I don't want to call him Bob. I want to call him Juan. It's a better. It's a better. It's, it's a better. It gives a better picture of who he was. Now, this is a person that came into this school, and. There are people that in that school who looked at him and they sneered when he came into the school. They looked at him like he was a piece of shit. And they talked about him that way. And I know that he was difficult and he was very weird, very bizarre energy. I mean, really weird, right? But I got it, you know, because I'm weird too. You know, I get it. It's okay. He's he's very strange, but he's also, you could just tell he was brilliant. Talk about synaptic, synaptic. What a brilliant mind and what a great poet, seriously. Anyway, he, he my class was the only one that he, he behaved in. And I don't, like, I don't like using the word behaved either, by the way. I would say my class is the only one that he went to, that he didn't walk out of or didn't, once we built a relationship. And it wasn't because I'm a great man or a great teacher, I swear, no. It was because of moments like that. You don't treat them like they're fucking, you know, so this is where I'm gonna get all SJW on you, you know? I'm gonna be angry, er, you know? Um, I can get pretty fired up when I think that uh, students are being disrespected. Mm -hmm. And anyway, and I always thought about one because they expelled him. Mm -hmm. Not because of something he did, but because of who he was. Because he was just, we, oh God, Jimmy, they would say, oh, one's here. They would say it and he would hear them roll their eyes. So they were kind of hoping that he didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And so when you put out that, that talk about non-invitational energy, right? That certainly wasn't magnetizing. And then eventually one, well, he was expelled on a Friday and nobody was consulted. Nobody came to me to ask what I thought, what, you know? And then, you know, he did it on Monday. He came to school and he came to the steps and he wanted to come in. 
And then some people on the staff came out, I'm not mentioning names, you know, or the place, but they came out, leave. You're trespassing. If you come back again, you'll be arrested. And so this is a student whose best friend had just been gunned down, just killed two weeks earlier, maybe three weeks, I don't know. His mother was in and out of jail. Like she just was, you know, in, in gang fights with knives and stuff. This kid's like whole life is surrounded by trauma. And he was potentially a brilliant student if you could just, you know, give him a shot, you know? And this is what you do. So when people get angry about the school to prison pipeline, they're not, they're telling you the truth. And you know what? No, I, I wanna, this is where he was a black kid. A black man, a young black youth in an inner city. And this is how we treated him. Now, it's interesting. I didn't racialize it. I saw it as a deeper problem. I, I, it was, a, it was a, they didn't see his intrinsic dignity. And um, I ran into Juan every, every few years. Now, I helped him to transition into a new program. I actually wrote up a whole report. I physically carried it to the next place so that they would know who he was. So they would not know not think that he was just some criminal. And they were shocked. I can't believe you did. I'm like, well, I can't believe no one does this. Mm -hmm. Why should you not have a file about where he just came from? He should not be coming into your program cold. And um, so I didn't yell at them. I'm getting all, what's that word? Uh, I'm getting indignant. So don't, don't worry, I'll calm down. Uh, he, um, okay. so yeah, years later, he yeah, he's in jail now. He's in prison. Yeah, he, I, I watched him I, uh, begin to sm commit smaller crimes, and then eventually he robbed a bank um, with a gun pointed at somebody. And so I look at that experience, and I look at all the different, you know, s s social ills, you know, and school climate and culture and workplace cultures and teaching and learning and, and yes, uh, disadvantaged populations and all that stuff comes into play. So uh, I'm glad I shared that story because it has something to do with the compassion. Um, I did want to create a safe trauma-informed environment. And I believe that we failed him by not doing those things. Um, and I'm certainly, he certainly obviously has to share the blame for his own outcomes, of course, partly. But so, 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 so the teaching life, the educator's life, it, it's really quite, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot there. Yeah, no, that's a very um, difficult thing to even imagine having to watch somebody going from being, you know, a misbehaving person that you're trying to help who antagonizes you to suddenly finding out they're in prison years later for robbing a bank. Yeah. That's quite a heavy thing. What yeah. would you say to people who say, you know, the reason he got expelled is his own fault. His bad behavior is his own fault. He's uh, robbed a bank. That's his own fault. He's in prison where he should be. He's just a dick. Let him go. It's not other people's responsibility. It's his. You didn't fail him. He failed himself. What would you say to those people? It's a, such an uh, amazing, I mean, it's, it's such a wonderful question, obviously. And it's like, it's so central to my actual work and to my life in a lot of ways. I, I, this is where, I know this is a hard one for me because if you had asked me that five years ago, I would have been a staunch, my, my, I would have been, it was our fault. We are the ones who failed him. And it, I, I would have been much more likely to, do, to take the route of what some people call critical social justice. I would have automatically said, push back. But now, no, because I see now that we have gone too far in the direction of not being responsible. We actually, we actually, there are ideas that are being put out there now that are so deeply harmful to the educational enterprise. I mean, I mean, I'm going to say again, deeply harmful to the whole thing, not just to individual students. Um, and one of those ideas is that now the these 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 racialized uh, frameworks that are coming out. That and I call you know I, I call it group identity essentialism. Um, that's a word that I use. It's a phrase I use because it's, it includes several different types of essentialism. There's race essentialism. There's gender essentialism, right? And there's other types. Um, uh, 
And, and so the idea is that you can ascribe some kind of or, or essence of, of or constellation of characteristics or thought processes or beliefs um, on anyone because they belong to a particular group identity. Uh, and, and so um, now one of the, I'm actually writing a series of essays, um, which I call, I'm calling the All We Are series. And um, it has three different sections. The second section that I'm currently working on is based on, a, on the writings of um, Eric Smith, who's a, 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 a professor of rhetoric and composition. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that he, uh, Give me one moment. I, I I I got lost. I was talking about group identity essentialism. Oh. Okay. Right. Okay. So. Thank you. All right. I had to sort of find my way back. Um. So he okay. he, 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 he created. Thank you. He created a a little bit of a distinction. Two main distinctions for a book that he wrote called uh, "Critique of Anti-Racism in the Rhetoric and Composition." And he talks about the, the, um, the rightful king and the sacred victim. Now, the rightful king, we know, is a, it can be a positive archetype, and that's a whole other thing. But what, when he talked about the rightful king, he was talking about, in a way, what isn't the, the usurping the rightful king. Not really. So the rightful king is, the, is a perspective of um, entitlement. I get to have this world because I built it, you know. And we, we can see that um, in, you know, racial ethnic, you know, people that are ethnic nationalists, for example. Uh, we're the ones who built, you know, Western civilization, so it should stay a white world. That's that's the rightful king perspective, mm -hmm. um, which he doesn't spend a lot of time on because his book is not really about that. I'm spending a little bit more time on it because he's a black man and he can be, he can just kind of move on from that quickly. I need to a little bit longer and then make sure that I am not ever misunderstood to belong to that paradigm because I don't. Now the sacred victim he talks about, and that's the one that the entire book is about that. And I'm just now starting to write some about that. The sacred victim paradigm is interesting because it, 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 it assigns in a, in a romanticized way, um, almost a preternatural, mystical, magical uh, wisdom to some cultures that are said to be lacking in other cultures, usually normative cultures, majority cultures. Notice how I'm being so vague. Um, so some of these cultures are, um, you know, one could say the indigenous wisdom, for example. And actually, I'm actually reading a book on, there is something to be said for some uh, beautiful sacred perspectives that one can find in indigenous traditions. However, one is not wise and magically wise for being indigenous. That's just romanticism. And, uh, and, then, and then one can then pretend that somehow the Western mind, you know, is somehow um, not wise. There's no wisdom at all, right? So one of the main, uh, it's, it's something that's becoming very popular and it's spreading in a lot of different places. It's not technically born from critical theory, but it's definitely sort of part of that larger umbrella of thought, critical theory, okay? Critical race theory, critical gender theory, basically, um, it's called, it's called uh, white supremacy culture. And the author's name is Tikam. I think it's, uh, I actually have it written down. So I wanted to I'll find it. Matthew it's Iglesias, Coates. What, what's that? Is it Coates? No, not Tony Hissey Coates. This writer's name is, huh, I guess I don't have it. Um, it'll come back to me. Um, it's, it's, if you Googled white supremacy culture, you'll find it. It's like, it's the first thing that comes up. And her name is Tika. Okun or something like that, close to that. Okay. And she, she's a woman that created this framework that uh, has been adopted by uh, the, 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 the outgoing chancellor of New York Public Schools, implemented this for the entire district. Okay, we're talking about- Tima like, Okun. Thank you, thank you, Tima, Tima Okun, thank you. Mm -hmm. She's a white woman, as usual, very wealthy, I'm not shouldn't say wealthy. Um, I would say uh, the, the well-to-do um, white academic who seems to believe that they know more than the rest of us about the, the suffering of other people, which is just really interesting. And and they create frameworks after frameworks and frameworks and frameworks and frameworks of all kinds of systems and models and theories. And somehow they get so lost in the theory they forget the reality. But so she's actually saying 
that white supremacy culture is it's it's deep it's deeply embedded in all of reality everywhere you go it's everywhere and objectivity the scientific method being polite being on time you know respecting other people's time by being on time punctuality that's white supremacy culture attention to detail love for details love for the written word um the love of learning that's race essentialism now see I, i'm not interested in any particular ethnicity including my own i don't care i mean you can it's not i'm not really interested in that part of it i'm more interested in how can you possibly think that people of color do not have those capacities in them first of all say that saying that those things are bad i'm not sure that's helpful it certainly isn't helpful for education for education um, and then also to essentialize them to be existent in one particular culture that's supposedly built for one particular eth ethnic group, then it's not accessible or intrinsically available to other ethnic groups like people of color, for example. It seems to me really unhelpful, to put it mildly. So why am I telling you that? Do you think this is an example of like a special pleading fallacy where she's upset about what she calls white supremacy culture? So she's used this phrase white supremacy that has associations with the KKK to describe something that actually you would see in any culture. So if you went to Japan, for instance, you could, by the same standards, describe Japan as a Japanese supremacy culture, too. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and you're right, special pleading. Um, you said something else just now that really kind of struck me. Um, Matthew Iglesias, I recommend you read it, I'm going to post it later. Matthew Iglesias wrote something about a year ago, maybe two years ago, about that training. And by the way, that training made its way into the Smithsonian Museum, uh, one, of the, one of the museums associated with the Smithsonian. Um, and they had a whole display, and it made, it made this particular ethnic group <laughs> that I belong to, it just made it seem like mystical and weird, and they had all kinds of panels and and it was just bizarre. And there was a lot of public outcry, so they took the whole thing down. Um, but students are learning this, you see. Uh, and uh, what Matthew Glacius points out, which is good, right? Dualistic thinking, either or thinking, is also being said to be intrinsic to, as you know, you know, we'll call it ethnic uh, supremacy culture. What she decries in her basic uh, framework, some of the basic ideas are things that are good to decry, right? Um, either or thinking isn't that great. Overly being perfectionistic and not allowing a little bit of flow is a, it is a good thing to critique, you know? It is a good thing to, to if we over systematize, systematize time and we don't allow for some full flow in there as well. Um, it is good to question that, I can see that. Um, but essentializing it into any particular group, it, it doesn't seem to be helpful. Um, and also, it, and this is what Eric Smith talked about, he wrote something for Newsweek recently about maybe over the summer about he, he, he feels that there's, a, there's an infantilization of people of color that he feels is not helpful either. And so I believe that my students, in fact, I know, and I've been doing this for so long and you can't tell me, I, I mean, I've, I've been around the block a bit here and I tell, I'm, I'm here to say with a lot of confidence that I've had so many types of students and all of them are capable of being on time, of respecting other people by being on time. All of them are capable of, of extremely detailed thought process and, and, and engineering and technology and mathematics. And as we all know, mathematics came from where? Was it the Middle East? Was it Islamic? At least some parts of math came from Islam and architecture. And we know that, that I believe it was the, also writing was not invented in the West, the printing press was invented, which of course made Western writing expand. But real quick, and the uh, the Ethiopian um, Enlightenment occurred nearly a hundred years before the Western Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment principles, the ones that uh, we are many people are wanting to, to protect, um, they themselves cannot be said to be part of any ethnic ethnic culture. They were just these 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 principles were written out and found in caves recently, I think, actually a couple, five years ago or so. And they were, again, they predated the Western Enlightenment. But why is it surprising that some certain values resurfaced throughout the world in different, you know, anyway? I guess well, I guess it works. That's yeah. why they, they tend to uh, keep 
popping up over and over again. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, I guess that makes me a bit of a universalist. Um, I think you actually are, um, given mm -hmm. what I've, I've read of yours. So you've, you've written an essay I wanted to talk to you about um, sure. called Why Educators Must Read Eric Smith, Carrying a Message Further. Uh -huh. And in this essay, you say, for educators in the West who teach students of color, indeed students from all walks of life in the 21st century, there was no avoiding these questions. The simple reason is that the primacy of social cultural identity has not only exploded into the mainstream over the past decade, but has become central to mainstream culture. Identity has become a primary foundation in the building of classroom cultures and curriculum throughout all levels of education. And this primacy must be adequately acknowledged and addressed if educators hope to have a chance to survive in their field. More importantly, educators will need to come to terms with the question of identity's place in the educational enterprise and formulate a clear path for integrating its promises and perils into their practice if they are to be effective in the classroom, unquote. Now, this is a very interesting um, passage to me because one of the things that it makes me wonder, and I'm curious how you would respond to this, is how is it possible um, for integrating the promises and perils of identity politics into the classroom if that ideology is totalitarian and really unreasonable and likes to subjugate people? Like, how can you be a good teacher and integrate identity politics into your teaching if that's how identity politics works? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, obviously, uh, I wanted to just quickly type up something um, to find it. Yeah, there it is, Combahee River Collective. So a couple of things. Uh, and again, I, and I learned a lot from Eric Smith's writings. I just, he really is, I have to say, really, uh, he's just very erudite, but very insightful. Um, I learned um, from him and then since then I've done more research, but the Combahee Collective was a feminist, uh, empowerment group in the 1970s. Um, and then the, the cohort from that group, the Black feminists uh, collaborated as well on this. They came up with the term identity politics. And, I, and the term was actually positive. And um, I actually believe in and support identity politics. Um, and what I, let me be clear about what I mean by that. And then let me make some distinctions because they're important. So, um, I, let's go with the Stone, Stonewall um, riots of 1968, right? Uh, I know there's a lot of mythology around that, and I know that it wasn't really, really a major riot. It was kind of like a, a kind of big kerfuffle, but it's kind of like, you know, but it was uh, uh, one of those moments that it was a solid, fuck you, we're not going into your goddamn cruiser. We're going, we're queer, we're here, and, you know, and... Um, um, I'm on that. I'm in that world, so I can say that uh, we um, are not going to be. You can, you are not going to take away our rights, and we are going to have to advocate for ourselves because no one else is going to. So you're going to have that kind of defiant, strong bonding together. Um, and then recently, in recent years, they now talk about how it was led by um, black trans people. Right? That's a little bit. Uh, that would be because intersectionalism has sort of come to dominate uh, the, the, the social justice left uh, advocacy movements. Um, and part of that is um, you want to make sure that we're not, you know, marginalizing or setting to the margins identities that have not, haven't been represented as much as they should have been. So it may not have been known until recently that it was actually a Black trans woman who, transgender woman, who, you know, led that riot. And so it is actually a good idea to sort of, you know what? Yeah, uh, if that's something that was true, then we need to make sure that that's, that's, that sort of becomes part of the narrative because it was part of the narrative. It was part of the story, the real story, right? So identity politics in that sense of um, people bonding together and finding allies to help them to um, achieve rights where they weren't rights, that is a good thing. And I know that you're not saying it isn't, right? Most people would actually say, well, yes, that actually is good and it's needed. 
So I, I, I've chosen, and I, and I wrote this somewhere in the essays, um, I've chosen not to use the term identity politics for that reason. I'm not going to use it. I will use the term identitarianism, though. Um, and okay, so what, the question- What's the difference yeah. about identity politics and identitarianism? How do you distinguish them? Yeah, uh, so identity politics is basically people coming together to advocate for their group. Okay, that's it. And it's good. And beautiful and it's been historically very powerful identitarianism now that's something i have a little the primacy of socio-cultural identity okay now there there are there are um white ethnic white ethnic advocacy groups right some people call them white nationalists um they call themselves they actually haven't they literally call themselves identitarians and they proudly say we are, you know, that they are identitarians and they will, without any embarrassment or shame, uh, they will say this, this, uh, you know, not only this country, but the entire Western civilization was built by European Americans and it belongs to European Americans. That's their perspective. And that's the rightful king perspective. Okay. We're the rightful kings. And you're, 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 you're coming in and, and, and we built the commons and you're guests here. And, um, that kind of thing, right? And so, in one of the things of that particular identitarian, and again, they call themselves that, uh, they will advocate for, they actually have words for it now, it's interesting. Uh, I forget them, but uh, they, they will advocate for having children to make sure that they're, they're afraid of the great replacement. They're afraid that the European American bloodlines will are going to run out because of immigration, and and they yeah. feel that they have the right, right. So that's that's that identitarianism. So that but, that sounds like right wing identitarianism. Right, right. That's that's. Um, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna call it right wing identitarianism if you don't mind. I'm, I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it right wing ethnic identitarianism only because okay. I don't think. I know you know this anyway, but I don't. I just don't think it's fair to always think of right wing in race terms. It's not fair. It's it's a very I don't know, and I'm not right wing. I'm more left for sure. I just the word right wing has been so unfairly used. Anyway, so I want to be just sens sensitive to that. So then we have the identitarianism that's not a word that's used by them, but by the left, right? But it is what they have becoming. I'm using now the term in a broader sense. It's basically um, my queerness, my transgenderness, my blackness, my whiteness, my maleness, my womanness my um, whatever, my sociocultural identity markers are, are the alpha and omega of my existence. And to that extent, I am not you either. And you could not know me and I could not know you. I'm not even sure if we should even be in the same room anymore, right? I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but I'm not really exaggerating too much. Uh, it's These people the, do come out segregation quite frequently. So you're oh, not uh, so segregation is very much uh, being talked about. Uh, and it's being practiced in the workplace and, and in schools, actually. Not, not permanent segregation yet, but they're, they'll, they'll literally take, you know, in New York, this, this has been happening a lot. They'll put entire groups, you know, in a, in a, a, of kids over here, the ones that belong to this identity group, and the ones that belong to this identity group over here. And then, they're, then they basically are teaching them to really identify with, with a real strong sense of boundedness, us and then them. And, oh man, it's so interesting to me. Uh, and I won't lie, if I, I can't, I have to tell you that I find this to be very troubling. I really do. Um, How long have you had to deal with this as an educator? Hmm. Just out of curiosity, has this impacted you at all in your particular teaching or is this hmm. stuff you read about mostly? Hmm. I'm gonna pause for a moment here. I have to pause. It's, it's, um, all I can say for now is that I have, I have advocated for a thoughtful, integrative approach to diversity, equity, inclusion in several communities in Mapada. And I have um, educated a lot of people about what could happen if we go down the road of extreme identitarianism. And I have advocated consistently in several places, several communities I'm a part of. Some of them might be employment oriented and some of them might be spiritual practice communities involved in, some of them online. 
Um, and I have uh, been, um, it, has, it has potentially impacted it. Let's put it this way. Uh, it is, it's, 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 it's waiting. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's at the gates, the dragons at the gates. It's like, you can't stem the tide of that kind of tsunami. You gotta be, you know, and I know that. And it's very interesting to be holding the line where I am. Um, I think what makes it easier for me to advocate is that I tend to put it, I, my framing is generally about, we, we can, and we should, we should include all people and we should forefront inclusion as a way of as as a way of doing business, all of us in our classes and our colleges, whatnot. Um, and, and that's good. If you you have to lead with that, you can't lead with screw identity politics and this diversity stuff is not really our strength. You can't lead with that. You shouldn't even. I don't, I'm not even sure it's a good idea to even think that way. Diversity is not a bad thing. Actually, it's kind of good. It's very enriching for me. Um, but I don't find a lot of people are against diversity. I don't find a lot of people being against inclusion. Um, and even equity in many forms can be something to get behind. It's actually a good thing. And I can talk about that and I will, I'd like to. And if I can't today, I will be anyway somewhere. Um, what people are concerned about is the extraordinary breathtakingly dogmatic approach to these things. And it's not just dogma, it's punitive and mean and cruel and dehumanizing. And not just dehumanizing to normative groups or majority groups. Uh, or, or like, notice how I'm being so vague because I just don't want to be on camera saying words because I don't want to be. You know, this is the way it is. Now. Well, it, well, in your essay, um, huh? you, you do yeah. say exactly that. You say the problem with racial essentialism is that those who believe they know the inner life and thoughts of other people based on their perceived racial category, and assume they can predict their character, morality, and personal beliefs and habits are prone to dehumanize the targets of their beliefs. Yes. That's a really interesting quote from you. Well, I, wanted, something I wanted to ask you, um, what, do you, what do you think dehumanization is in this context? Okay. Now it depends on what we want. Now I I, I I've grown. I'm I'm a, I'm a more mature now than I used to be, right? So some of the things I might say now, people from my younger years were like, "Really, you, Steve?" Right? You 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 evolve in life. Yeah. But I can. I think I can fairly say right now that I don't really need people to think I'm smart. But I sure needed that, like say, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 15. You know, the older I get, the more the more I the more mature, I guess, the more maturing is happening in me, the less I need to be seen as the one who gets it, right? So, mm -hmm. so I'm not personally in needing you um, to think of me as smart, but I definitely don't want you to think of me as a bad person. Mm -hmm. I still have that need not to be seen as bad. Uh, I don't want someone to think that I have hatred or that I want to dominate and hurt. Uh, I just, to me, I, I just, it's just terrible, you know, to be seen that way. And it's not just narcissistic needs or the need, it's not just a narcissistic injury where you, you're not, you know, identifying, you're not mirroring my, my self image as being a great man or any of that stuff. No, it, it's something a little worse. Um, oh, I had an interaction with a woman. Oh gosh, I, I'm going to share the story. I'm going to do it. Go ahead. It was bad. I'm going to do it. Um, what am I supposed to do? Nothing. I mean, you gotta be, you gotta be real. You can't just be abstract. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm going to tell this story, but I'm not telling it to give you empathy and I'm not saying it because it's going to, uh, you know, and even that, of course, you know, I had a significant death that happened in my life in, in 2013 and another one that happened. I had so many deaths in the past years, like, I mean, incredible, very dear people dead suddenly dead, suddenly dead, suddenly dead. The first one of that line of people was my, uh, was a sibling. Uh, it was a, a close relative who died um, by, by guns, right? Gunshots. And the gunshots were police gunshots. So, you know, this was, you know, back, you know, almost, it wasn't a decade, I guess it was eight years ago. Now, 
this, of course, is a kind of experience that can be very, um, it's, 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 a, it's incredibly destabilizing more than anything. I, I don't really know. I can't really speak for other people. It was, certainly was destabilizing for me and my family. And the reason why I'm bringing that up at all is I moved into a house some years later. I was going to be a roommate. And this was a, in, back in 2016 when everything was heating up in the culture wars, like everything was. And I moved in with these people and it was, I was having a wonderful conversation with one of the roommates. And she um, was a very strongly identified with uh, her ethnicity. Um, and this was, she used terms, with, she, I, I gave her a beer and we were going to talk about these wonderful experiences and uh, putting up new curtains and drapes and stuff. And, and then all of a sudden, she started throwing these weird spicy terms out, like in the conversation that were nothing to do with us. It was weird. She was basically imposing into, she was imposing on our new relationship. I didn't even know her. She was bringing in this ideology stuff, like really hard, hardcore. And then she started getting angry and started yelling at me and you, you know, she's for my, you know, for, for my sociocultural identity. You people don't know what it's like. You people this, you people that. She's like, turn on the faucet, white supremacy, open the fridge, white supremacy. Uh, hold a beer, white supremacy, it's everywhere. And, and she was basically, and then she was sort of going off on me about all these terrible things that my people did. And it was really something I'd never seen before. Uh, I'd never seen that level of, um, I now know, of course, what it's all about. And I, at, at that time, uh, these terms that she was using, I didn't, you know, it was very, um, she was very like Evergreen State College, to be honest with you. It was, it was very much like Evergreen before the evergreen thing happened. Mm -hmm. And then I, and then when she's like, you know, you have no idea what it's like. And then she started talking about police violence and stuff. And this is what I did. And this isn't an actual, I'm telling you something that, that occurred. And I did this, I, I actually talked about pacifying earlier. And I said, I'm gonna use, a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, again, I'm, I'm gonna use a, a different name. I'm gonna say Stacy. I've never lived with a person named Stacy. So um, Stacy, Stacy, Stacy. I even did it like this, I was Stacy. I, I should just let you know, just before you continue. I really, I really understand why you're angry about all these things. I really do. But before you continue, I, I thought you, you should know that, you know, my own relative died by police just two years ago. I, I just thought you should know. You know, I, I wasn't trying to um, do a whataboutism. I wasn't trying to be mean. I wasn't trying to get sympathy. I just, I just thought maybe if you could see that I was actually somebody that really does care about black people being killed by cops that I really do care about police violence and and she just said so and then she just lit in and then she said that all these things that occurred were a correction for history so anything that happens to my people is a correction for history or historical wrongs and the karma that we've developed and all that stuff and I thought this is unbelievable and I left I moved out the next morning because I cannot be somewhere where somebody would celebrate the death of a, of, a, of, a, of a relative. Now, I'm choosing to say it's relative and, uh, right now. I'm not, because I, I want to maintain a little distance from the story. Um, it was a very close relative, and I'm going to write about it as part of these three, this series of writing I'm putting out. Um, but I, I mentioned this, and I know it's an extreme version of dehumanization. Okay, I know that. Um, but but well, let me explain what I mean. The mechanics of dehumanization is that she didn't see me as my human being. She saw me as a symbol of, uh, of, of a collective identity that she despises and hates. She saw me through the lens of her, so her, own, her own deep attachment to her sociocultural identity. Um, and what made it dehumanizing is that I was no longer a human being to her. I was a symbol. I was just a data point. So much so that she could celebrate what I think can reasonably be called a horrifying death of a close relative. And again, I'm not saying she represents the movement, not at all. I'm not saying that everyone's gonna be like Stacy. I know that. 
and I'm sure she's grown since then. It's been five years. I haven't seen her. I don't want anyone to do with her. <laughs> she's wacko, one could say. Um, but she does represent the ideological framework itself, though. She represents where it where where it heads towards. Because once you reify, you know, or thingify, once you solidify or reify your an identity, a collective identity, to the to to to, to the exclusion of any common humanity, I think that there's only I think that, that 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 can go in a really bad direction. Anyone, anybody. Yeah, so that's my sense. Do you know what really frightens me at the moment? If we were to play this story that you just said yeah. <laughs> to an, most Hollywood celebrities, most of the corporate world, most of the Democratic Party, most of the BBC here in England, they would side with her. I know they would, which is why I almost want just to be cut out of the interview. <laughs> Um, I know. See, and, and yeah. I, I don't think it, it's a bad thing at all to share because it's I just, think what you're describing from her is genuinely correctly described as wacko behavior. It's a hate ideology. It's evil. It's, it's, it's hateful. And, and it's, um, and it's, it's make this fashionable right now. And it's I, evil. And, you know, I know I'm being so diplomatic. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty hard. And it's also unintelligent. And now this is gonna, I, I'm not talking about this particular person. I'm talking about the uh, identitarianism in general when taken to its extreme. Because you see, can I, I can only tell you, and you probably will believe me because based on like, just the way I'm manifesting in the past like two hours, trust me when I, I say that I could have been the most wonderful ally for her and for police violence against people of color and for education for people of color. I still am. And by virtue of my own previous commitment and frankly, some of my mindfulness training is, you know, some of my mindfulness training, I practice to my best of my ability, right speech. I practice right action. I can't always do it that well, but I, I have learned to, to, I can't, control my feelings, but I can control my words. And um, uh, th why that matters is, okay, I, I know what I was gonna say. It, it's unintelligent because I think, I, and it's a strange thing to say, it's so, it actually presumes kind of a, an arrogance a little bit, or my, forgive me to say that, but because the problem is that these, these some of these ideological frameworks, they sound so clever, they sound so, because it's so academic sounding and just sounds so smart. But when you really get into the substance of it, there's nothing all that smart about isolating people from each other, compartmentalizing people from each other, causing enemyship between you and other people, um, mm -hmm. hating and, and, and reducing people to caricature, creating frameworks of terror and fear, using extreme rhetoric, uh, and being just what I, what I actually call it fashionable meanness. Yeah, well, one, one of the things that you say here in this piece is you say to believe that we cannot empathize with people from other racial and ethnic groups or that we cannot develop the capacity to understand the experiences of individuals from different ethnic or racial groups with a different collective history is to say, quote, I could not weep for King Lear's misfortune for I have never been a king, unquote. That's a very powerful way of putting it. Um, but I was also thinking, okay, if we put our devil's uh, advocate cap on yeah, go, go and, and we imagine, okay, what would our opponents say to us after we've just, after I've just called them evil, <laughs> they would. <laughs> and I'm trying to maintain relationships. So I'm trying to avoid spicy language when I can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think this is warranted. Um, but um, what they would say is, well, look, you like identity politics of the sort that you described earlier, the Stonewall stuff, the civil rights movement of the 60s and yeah. 70s. Women's rights. Yeah, yeah. women's rights. Um, all of that stuff that you take for granted is positive historically. You're beautiful. Depend, depended on people seeing themselves as oppressed tribes and seeing other people as symbols of oppression rather than as human beings. If people looked at each other as human beings, none of that stuff would have ever happened. What would you say to that? That's very interesting to me. And I'm so glad you're asking me that question. This is very good. 
Um, I would say that they're, they've, they're, they've, there's a buried presupposition in the statement itself that needs to be recognized and eliminated immediately. Um, those things were not achieved because they treated the opponents as abstractions to, to, to hate and to, and to, and to be a, and to, you know, to go up against. Um, almost every uh, major um, uh, movement uh, for rights and equality and uh, really, really strongly depended on building a coalition of support and building a, a, um, a consensus of, of, of well-wishing from many people. Um, and uh, and I know, I know uh, I, it's actually in the current zeitgeist, it's, you're actually, it's not cool to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. Everyone, it's so funny how that works now, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because you said I'm not here just to, uh, I'm here for what I'm here for. I actually believe in nonviolence. Um, I just do. And I believe that, I know that Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't, wasn't perfect. I know that Gandhi wasn't perfect. I know the stories. I know that Gandhi was, you know, I know that he was a, an imperialist and I know that he had some pretty unsavory ideas about certain ethnic groups. I understand that. I'm not, I'm not defending them as individuals, but I don't think anyone's perfect anyway, and we all are evolving. And uh, so I'm not gonna reduce anyone to mistakes they've made in their lives. I'm only talking about the mission. And um, if you wanna support your mission, and if you want, if you really, a key mission support is not freezing the, uh, uh, the, um, can you, can, you, can you just indulge me for one moment? Yeah. Uh, if you, there's a website I built last year. I actually, I'm always building websites, wondering if maybe one of them will go somewhere, but this one never did, and that's okay. It's called Standing Silent Protest, standingsilentprotest.com.org. I, 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 I hope it comes up. It probably won't. I'm having some internet stuff come on. Okay. Oh, but I can do I'll have a look see. Okay, well, yeah. I, .com isn't working. Let's try .org. No, that's not working. I'll just, oh, really? um, oh no, I think what happened is my keys started tapping. Right. 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 Standing, right. standing what? Standing silent protest. Oh, I got it. Okay. I can also uh, share my screen. <laughs> um, it, it, it would actually be, it's, it, but I can just read it to you. I yeah, actually- be best. Read it to yeah, me. Yeah, uh, I, let me see. There's a, uh, the story of silent, can you one moment? So it's, a, it's I, I put it up there. I actually bought another URL, standing silent witness, because I thought that was a better term. So I'm going to change it to that. Okay. And I don't know if it's going to go anywhere, and it probably won't. It's just me wondering if there's another way, right? So I created um, three, what I call the, the, the three dignified principles of silent protest. And it, it, it's, it's an answer to your question, um, um, Greg. Um, kind, uh, so, so kind eyes, soft thought, firm stance. So kind eyes, and I'll, read it, I'll just read it really quickly, it's short. We practice a gentle gaze that maintains both inward focus to maintain awareness of our body and emotions so that we can maintain self-discipline and regulate our emotional reactivity and outward focus to quote, take our seat in witnessing the suffering and injustice that we are protesting. That's kind eyes, thought, uh, soft thought. We practice viewing perpetrators of injustice as still human and as simply in the middle of an incomplete process of awareness and knowledge. We maintain an openness to all possible circumstances that might've led perpetrators to contribute to suffering, injustice, and the creation of unjust systems. And then firm stance. We practice strong, but not rigid posture while maintaining our kind eyes and soft thought to maintain solid conviction, message discipline, and self-respect. Now, I love that. I might be able to do something with it um, sometime down the road, but I do know that it's certainly influenced by some you know, spiritual principles for sure. And I know that Gandhi's work was, and I know that Martin Luther King Jr.'s. Um, I know Gandhi used to say, my friend, the enemy. 
he would say that, my friend, comma, the enemy. And that just appeals to me. So um, my answer again uh, to the, what's, what's being presupposed in your original question was, um, well, you know, we, we got all these things to happen, you know, you know by uh, dehumanizing other people. It's like, no, we didn't, no. I mean, Lincoln had to do some very serious political strong arming. I know some pretty corrupt stuff behind the scenes to get the Emancipation Proclamation to happen. I get that too. And we all know the, what was it, 840,000 people dying on the Civil War fields. So yeah, I, I, I certainly see that and we see, but there's a lot of, a lot of space was created for building relationships with the reluctant supporters. And you can sometimes convince people in power to do the right thing, but we all know you also have to grab it if you have to, we know that. So I'm not being all softy here. I don't know if they answered your question, but. No, it did. Um, so I suppose, you know, one of the difficult things is it's hard to know how much of the civil rights stuff in the past was an example of really benign people wanting equal rights, but also wanting their oppressors to join hands with them and stand alongside them without demanding that the oppressors sacrifice anything or be dehumanized. And how much of the identity politics of the past was radical when it comes to explaining like why things have changed. Because um, a lot of people would say, well, Martin Luther King isn't what explains why things have gotten better. It's all of the more militant activists who you know, were working on his behalf. And it's also the other more radical people like Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael who invented our current conception of systemic racism. That that's why we had progress. It's not because of these nice mainstream kumbaya type figures. You're so um, provocative. <laughs> uh, I, and, 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 you know, I myself have been a radical firebrand in certain areas of my life where I have gotten things to happen. I've gotten change to happen in certain organizations. And uh, I've, there are things I've done behind the scenes uh, in certain injustices that occurred that I did. I, 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 I built campaigns. And I can be, I have a colleague friend who says, Yes, I talk about kindness a lot and I've practiced to the best of my ability diplomacy and warmth and compassion and sensitivity, but I'm also a mama bear. And, um, and I can be, um, and I, I have to talk about my own self here because it, you know, it, it, in the end, we're not just talking about abstract principles and I know how to advocate. And I know sometimes you have to be, um, you need to be fierce. Um, and you sometimes cannot mince words. You have to be direct, especially when someone is doing something very wrong. That's and why I, I call them evil. Yes, uh, right. Uh, yes, <clears throat> um, I'm not there yet. Uh, I'm still kind of feel like I'm, main, I'm trying to maintain relationships, and I'm doing well with you know in my career, which is not easy because it has been on what I do for a living. You know, it's it's we have to come back to that. Uh, my point is, is that uh, yes, we there is a there is very much a, a place for strong advocacy, and it has Martin, uh, Malcolm X ha has contributed in a very good way, in a lot of ways actually. But don't forget that he also evolved beyond that when he went to Mecca, and he he you know something happened. It's called mercy. The principle of mercy can be practiced in an argument, but the actual experience of mercy can be transformational. And it's not that he would announce his former style of advocacy, but he saw it in, in its light, in, 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 in a broader way. He knew that it was incomplete. Um, now, I wanna talk really quickly, if you don't mind, about the, the letters to the Birmingham jail. Letters sure. from a Birmingham jail. Right, Martin Luther King. Yeah, Martin Luther King Jr. Because a lot of people, now I, um, about five years ago, I think I was definitely much more liked than I am now uh, by the worlds that I grew up in, uh, or the worlds I, I came of age with. Uh, a lot of my friends, you know, just, I, I, I've been critiqued a lot, I mean a lot, by people who identify themselves as the left, if you will, or as Marxists or communists or social justice advocates or feminists and or just 
being what they call themselves leftists, some of them really do. And, and again, I, I don't want to I don't want to paint them or caricaturize them or solidify them either, right? I don't want to do that. But my general, but but generally speaking, um, the world and it, and it's still the world that I feel more identified with. As I as when I talk about teaching and learning, you know, I'm like this guy, my God, he ain't no fucking like winger, you know. I mean, clearly not. In, in my approach, it's like, um, it's just that alongside my, I think, pretty clear advocacy, not as a, as a knight in shining armor, not, 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 not to save their thing, but just an advocate, like a really serious disciplined advocate for people who come from um, disadvantaged, uh, you know, circumstances. And I'm very sensitive to that. And I want to do my best to, for them. Um, and if you don't mind, later on, I want to go back to the question of empathizing for people from other groups, because it's not just, it's probably the most central thing I care about, but it's not central in this moment. Um, alongside uh, all that, I also have been very critical of what I often call, and people roll their eyes, <laughs> ideological totalism. Um, and, uh, I'm, and, and so the phrase is not, I was popularized by Robert J. Lipton who wrote a book called The Psychology of Totalism that came out, I think in the late 60s. And it was about these different methods of indoctrination that were used by Chinese communist um, uh, operatives, you know, when they captured Americans and other Western soldiers. I forget which war it was, was it Vietnam or was it um, I forget, a Korean war. So there's, a, there's a several different types. Uh, there are se several different ways in which you can recognize um, the ideological totalism was operational, right? One of them is, uh, it's called um, loading the language. You, you overwhelm people with the jargon and endless theoretical jargon and language, and you do it so relentlessly. What happens over time is that our minds begin to reify the concepts and they begin to take on a life of their own. They become more real than they really are. So what, what was once abstract kind of turns almost, it doesn't actually turn concrete, but it takes on, uh, it seems more concrete. And so loading the language, and one of the ways you, you do that, um, there's another phrase that you came up with called thought terminating cliches. Um, and I noticed a lot of that was happening on, on social media online. Um, I'm gonna go back to the Birmingham jail, it's all related. Um, so, uh, so, so I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about that, but the reason why I'm mentioning all that here is, is that, it's not like I became this wishy-washy moderate, okay, we all get along. And I've had people make fun of me, people, old friends, like really dear friends, hugging me three years ago when I have these losses and now you call them making fun of me and say, oh, here's my, here comes Mr. Kumbaya. Okay, all right. So what do you want us to do then, right? So there's this, um, so I get that a lot. I, uh, what I often will run into people and they'll say, I get what you're trying to do, Steve, but I can't support it. You're, you're, it's like you're, 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 you're reaching out to th these people and you shouldn't be. They just write them off, you know, or I'll get some from people like, um, I, I've been unfriended, you know, on, on, on social media a couple of times. Not a lot though. And part of the reason is that I have not been disrespectful. I mean, I, that's, I, I've been consistently respectful no matter what, because I'm just gonna do it. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not gonna be fierce or, or, or somewhat, um, relentless I'm gonna like I shall have this matter heard I shall have this matter placed on the table I will have it right I'll keep doing that but I won't call you an asshole or a prick I'm not gonna make fun of you I'm not gonna troll you I'm just gonna insist upon it but sometimes I'll back off though because you don't want to sometimes you gotta it's a duty to retreat sometimes and let 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 let, let, let the air breathe what I'm not is the, is the wishy-washy moderate who's afraid of progress. Oh, why can't we just let them be, you know, why can't we, she shouldn't have given up her seat on that bus. She should have just done what she was told. We'll, 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 we'll pass a law in five years. And, you know, oh, it's okay that they're sitting at the lunch counter, but they're not allowed to sit at, the, at this one. They can sit in their own black uh, cat coffee shop over there. We don't, we don't, you know, let's not, you know, mess things up and upset people. That's not what I'm doing. That's not what most of us are doing. When people talk about the letters from a Birmingham jail, I find it to be not honest. I'm, um, I, I am for progress. 
And in fact, I'm going to even say uh, I'm, I'm definitely still progressive in the sense that I believe that progress is possible. And there's a lot of progressive things I like. Uh, I just, what I question is the ideological entrancement that people want to bring along with the, with the progress. And so when I, when I, when I, what I'm personally am saying is this. I'm going to say it straight out. In 2019, do you know how many unarmed black men were killed by cops? Can you guess? A small amount. Yeah, you probably already knew that. Um, so Roland Fryer, which none of my progressive friends have even heard of him because they don't read, they, they, they stay stuck and they read only, you know, certain, uh, whatever you call it. So, God, they don't even seek out information that could possibly counter their narrative. It just, it's just, it's a, look, getting angry and you know you saw me earlier i showed emotion in my certain talk about certain students of mine who are marginalized and you've seen it it's real i get it i'm on your side man but you can't be but don't expect me to be real angry about something that didn't happen 19. now that's a lot and mind you i've had this experience and i assure you that one person being gunned down by cops is that's too many but 19 is not thousands and it's very important that we, that this is what's, what I'm feeling is getting lost, is um, Roland Fryer and also, uh, it'll come back to me, another person, and he's, he's an African-American, by the way. It, it shouldn't matter, but it does, unfortunately, carry more social capital if you're writing about those issues. It's just the way it goes. Um, it, it, there's actually a phrase that's called stay in your lane. Like, I'm not even allowed to talk about these things, but hey, I got to. Um, my, 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 my actual profession demands it from me, really. But Roland Fire writes about this, um, and the other person's name it has disappeared from my mind. It'll come back. He's another African-American associate, I believe, with Harvard, who writes about um, hope, hoax, hate, uh, hate hoax crimes. Wait, hoax hate crimes. And you wouldn't believe how many there have been in the past, like, five years. There's a market for that now. And so there's that, right? Now... The, and when it comes to the shooting by police officers, um, and in one of these uh, art, uh, uh, articles or research reports, they would ask people uh, how, how, how many, they would, you know, how many do you think were killed, you know, in 2019? And you, you would get these incredible numbers. Some people, and I don't remember the actual uh, statistics, but, you know, some people would say tens of thousands, some would say thousands, and some would say hundreds. And, and, and some would use language like they're being hunted down in the streets. There are politicians who say these things. Go out there and, you know, don't let people in the cap, you know, go and like interrupt dinners and stuff and go after people and we're, we're going to keep the streets, you know. And look, again, I understand anger and I understand fierce militant advocacy and 100%, especially if you can't get forward moving on something and you just keep hitting a wall. And I'm not here to tone police. But you've got to make sure that you're landing it. You, you, you have to make sure you're, you got to know what's going on. You've got to be informed about the narrative. You know, I feel like a lot of us are being led, we're being guilted into being in full of rage and fear. And part of that is based on narratives that are not, frankly, based on something that's real. Now, what is real, and this is the research that's bearing this out, we know that police are, in fact, routinely much more harsh with um, with with you know people of color than they are with with uh, non people of color, people not of color. Uh, we know this that but there, but the research is showing also that they're less likely to kill though, which is interesting. And then there's other research that's showing it's actually poor people, people of, who are who are of lesser means and have, have less uh, political connections and are perceived to be less powerful. And that actually includes poor whites, okay? And so it's not surprising then that, because it is true that African-Americans, and there's a lot of, there's a lot there that I'm 100% on the progressive side on that. Um, property taxes, funding, uh, funding housing, I mean the property taxes, funding uh, public schools. And, I, and I've been in so many schools, and I am telling you, compared to the white suburbs, suburban schools I've taught in, um, the ones, that at least for the decades I was in there, 
they're, they're, the, these, these institutions really were less funded, you know? They were not properly staffed and they weren't like updated technologically. And there is an, a, a huge advantage differential. There is, so there is such a thing as, as uh, this is what again, privilege theory does have some applications. There are advantages. There, I'm gonna say there are disadvantages to being black in America, especially in certain uh, you know, cities and it's a fact. So that contributes, of course, um, to, you know, violence and crime statistics. We all know that. So, but what I, I want to go back to what I'm saying, we should absolutely keep going and let's be fierce and advocating for change in all these ways, 100%. But I'm not asking us, I'm not saying that we should be gentle and sweet and loving dubbing all the time. So, so the letters from the Birmingham jail, those of us who are critiquing the extreme rhetoric and really over the top uh, narrativi narrativizing of the critical social justice left or critical, critical social justice, very particular framework, well, the critical theory informed social justice framework. You see how to do this fancy talk? We're critiquing the extremeness of the thoughts themselves based on narratives that are not based on empirical truth. So that's not letters from Birmingham jail. There's, you're not, there's no wishy-washy martyrs who just want to be nice to everyone. So I guess I'll, I guess I try to get through that. But. Okay, so <laughs> putting on my uh, devil's advocate cap again. Yeah, yeah. Suppose um, an identitarian person of color says to you, well, as long as there's a difference between how many of my people get shot and how many of your people get shot by the police, even if it's a proportional difference, I have a right to be angry with you because that means we live in a system of oppression where my people are disadvantaged and your people benefit. And that means you as an individual benefit because you don't have to worry about cops the way that I do. And I have a right to be angry at you for that. What would you say to this person? Well, this person, this this is this already happened to me several times. So, or, um, yeah. So, my my first again, my first response would say, well, I just want to. Uh, we we have our perspectives, and you have yours, and I res I understand. I'm not going to try to change it, but your people are my people, and my people are your people. When you say my people, I have an affinity for your for your people, and I consider them to be part of my people too. Although I do that, there are differences, and there are. Di advantages that that people that look like me have in certain parts of society especially with those who have st stronger economic means than i do um and you do have the right to be angry at me you have the right to feel whatever you want to feel but i do not believe your anger is merited i don't believe i deserve it i believe that your anger that you feel towards me personally is based on your look, seeing me as representative. You're representationalizing me. You're not actually seeing me. And I think it's been, it'll be in your interest and in your people's interest to, to not representationalize me, but to see me as me. And then, and then how can I help? You know, how can I help? Well, I'd like to what would you say if they said, you don't get to determine what I can and can't do to you and how I can and can't represent it? how I can and can't represent you is your job as a privileged person to give me your privilege and that's it. Shut up and do it. Mm -hmm. Well, see, and, and so uh, my response to that would be, um, uh, I, I'm not asking, I, I'm not dictating to you. I'm not even interested in, in, in influencing you to represent me in, in any way or the other, and at least not in this moment. I'm saying you're representationalizing me, meaning you're looking at me as a representation of something. And I'm telling, I'm telling you that it's 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 not accurate. It's inaccurate. And um, what I what I now this is what we're going to talk about equity. And I actually have a name. I have I actually think about this a lot. So there's equity, right? Um, now there's performative equity, and then there's I'm not sure what the other the, the, its opposite is, but performative equity is when you, you, you basically reduce yourself and me into representations, and then you create this sort of story that exists where I'm the villain and you're the good person, you're the, you're the sacred victim. 
And the sacred victim is has every right to grab things from me, the villain. Um, and you've already strayed from empirical reality there because You might not have, let me, let, me, let me back that up a little bit. You have to contextualize, you, you've got to contextualize, but um, there's a, to, let, me, let, me, let me, I'm gonna have to speak in, their, in that language just to make it really simple. You're supposed to, you're supposed to you have this, this thing called privilege. It's, it's, some, it's a bad thing and it's operational inside you, right? And you're supposed to do something with it. You're supposed to use your blank privilege, right? Um, for marginalized people, like that's that's the sort of um, the, that's we're, now we're getting into the realm of theology, soteriology. That's the salvation for those of us with the sin of privilege. It's a very religious, uh, a fundamentalist mindset we're talking about here, which is scary, frankly. You can't get through to people with that rigid mindset. But I do understand the basic concept, and I actually practice that really. I mean, so performative equity, though, is like it, that. It's a it's a big performance, bad and good and big grand storyline and um, good people, bad people. It's just, it's, 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 it's religious mythology really. And it's performative, but you know what I do? I spent two hours on Thursday teaching somebody with his mouth puppet, how to speak a language so he gets to have a job so he can survive in this world. I, I give a lot of my time without extra pay actually, it's, you know, providing instruction. I've, I literally, my Amazon account can prove it. Buy, my, I buy my students books all the time. We have texts and emails and uh, extra support with their writings. Um, I, I got a woman, uh, she's now studying in a, in a master's degree program for international relations, very dark skinned black woman who was a, in my class, uh, who's my professional communications class. And I was like, my God, do you have any idea that you have this incredible ability to see multiple perspectives? Every time you speak, you, you integrate everyone else's idea and seamlessly without any effort. Have you considered, you know, actually, she actually took my, my perspective. I know she, she went, she went for it. And, uh, and, uh, and so now she's doing that. Her name is, um, I'll call her Jennifer. Um, and it's just incredible. See, and to me, and what is that? And honestly, I'm, I'd be lying to you if I told you it's equity. It was just me being a human, just decent human. But one could say that I was using my networking, my abilities, my knowledge of what's out there to, you know, and this is interesting though, so interesting. I practice real equity too. There's this pra pra pragmatic equity, how's that? Practical equity. So I will actually, um, so I'm choosing a, 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 a piece of writing by Roxanne Gay. She's a black woman who talks about blackness she talks about what she calls fatness these are her words mm -hmm. um she talks about um uh being a lesbian right again her words so we, we we read an article of an essay that she wrote about um the marginalization she feels for being overweight and that she feels that she's more pre uh, she gets more prejudiced discriminatory treatment and humiliation from people for her body type than she does for her her skin and and, that, and she talks about intersectionality in that way. It's like there's different intersections of identities that I'm actually being hurt by. And, and it's, it's her own unique constellation of oppressions that she, you know, and so I will, that will be, what we'll, I will put that onto the space and we'll do that. And huh, it's so interesting. It's so funny too, yeah. I mean, everything. And if you look at even the study of the writings, my point is, is that, I, I will actually literally and intentionally um, forefront or foreground the experiences of other people that I might not necessarily call on. No, I share works of, of um, white as much. Part of the reason is that I do wanna, I try to be reach everybody as I can. You know, that, that's good teaching in general. It's called, it's called oh, this is interesting. It's called culturally responsive teaching. And the Republicans, the conservatives and right wing people hate that phrase and they're wrong. It really is really helpful to share with students um, experiences of themselves that, that they are, that they can see themselves as the, um, to see themselves represented at least in some of the literature. But sometimes 
in the name of equity, we will foreground right uh, literature that uh, that that speaks to the experiences of you know I'm going to use their the, the phrase that I use marginalized bodies, marginalized people. Um, and the very first thing, so I'm, I know it's a long answer to your to your question, um, but all I can say to you, the angry person who hates me and wants me to be punished, and you want me to give you some what's mine. All I can tell you is that I'm going to give all that I have to give, that I can give, by the way, that I can give to, if you want to say your people, then you can say that, because I still feel inside my heart that you're my people too, and I'm your people. And you don't have to believe that. I'm not going to impose my universalism on you. Um, and I've taken in your intersectionalism, and I've integrated it into my universalism, but I'm not giving up my universalism, and I'm not giving you my dignity. I'll have my dignity and you can have yours, but I'm not going to give that up. Um, now, that's, 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 I feel, pragmatic and fair equity, but performative equity is, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot too much of that. Whew, long answer there. All right, what would you say to somebody from the other side of the aisle who <laughs> says, the reason why there's a problem with African-Americans being disproportionately shot it's because they're disproportionately represented in homicide. And the reason why you have problems with them not having the same advantages as white people in the US is because of a small group of black people who are criminals, who are messing it up for everything uh, that other black people have to live with and live around. And if anything, black people are much more likely to get killed by other black people than they are by white people or white police officers. So really, they should be angry at the small group of black people keeping everybody else down rather than picking a fight with you. What would you say to that person? Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I'm so, I have to say, I do feel somewhat well-versed in the talking points from both sides because I get attacked by everybody, Jesus Christ. That's all uh, right. I mean, just yesterday, I, I, I got I, a, a person who's a feminist, a wonderful human being, I really do, really like her a lot but she just really was disappointed in in me um and that's the word she used she couldn't believe that i had a perspective on something and then in another group i was somebody was talking about blacks and browns uh, having a less iq i was just irritated by that i'll tell you I mean, it, it's related to, you, to what you're saying uh you know he's like um he's this is a, a private group um and he's and he says um um now, funny, I don't want to say it, right, out of context. I'm going to say purple and green, okay? <laughs> but that's not the colors he used. Purple and green dragons are the ones that uh, statistically are not taking um, the, the, the jab, you know, the uh, vaccine. Purple and green dragons are also the lowest IQ people. You do the math, right? And then there was some other points being made that I thought I agreed with in terms of, yes, we should get the vaccine, hold the thing. Um, uh, but I, I just thought, you know, that's such a crass bonehead thing to say. I didn't say crass or bonehead to him. And if he sees this, I don't usually keep your name, name, name calling, but, um, and then this other guy comes on and he's very intelligent, like very intelligent. Like, I mean, you can just tell, like he, 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 he very, um, definitely, um, uh, it certainly seems to be coming from the right, that's for sure. And he was just so articulate and dry and emotionless and bare bones facts. And he accused me, he didn't say, I didn't say, I shouldn't say accused. He just bluntly stated that um, the reason why I was, uh, I found myself oppositional to that idea that green and purple dragons are low IQ is uh, he said is ideologically motivated because I'm not willing to do to know the, to to you know to face the truth of that. And then I asked him to share. You know, do you have anything to share with me that could be convincing? Because you know what I did was I actually spoke in Spanish because I speak Spanish, uh, and I and I began to talk about in this in this particular post. Um, the reason why I did it wasn't to show off. Uh, I, he's a person from Eastern Europe, and English is his second language. And I, and, I, and I used a bunch of phrases that he might not be used to seeing and hearing. Like, um, I forget, you know, I just, uh, I, when I use the word fan, for example, 
which is a kind of an outdated uh, uh, sl you know, slang from urban culture now, but, um, but he might never have heard the word fan, but I threw it in there. So I threw in a bunch of localisms and a bunch of regionalisms and I threw in, then I, then I wrote an entire paragraph uh, critiquing his idea of black, green and purple dragons being low IQ. And then I basically in Spanish, and, and then I said to him, you know, try to see if there's, if you're, if you're frustrated in any way by my communication, by the references I made, by the phrases I used, and by, in some cases, the language itself, should I then accuse you of being low IQ? Because there is something to the, to the argument. There's at least something to that argument that sometimes these tests um, don't take into account multiple variables. Now, I'm not here to argue for or against, so I don't really want to get lost in that rabbit hole because I'm not actually well versed enough. Um, but then the, then I did have a couple things to say. And then the guy, the, the guy I'm going to call the very smart guy, right? Very smart. I mean, really, clearly. He was, you know, yeah, well, yeah, 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 you're still your, your ideologically motivated. And no, I'm not going to do your research for you. You should go find it on your own. If you really wanted to find out the truth of this, you would do your own research. And I always find that people are more motivated when they find their own research. And I said, okay, fine. But the reason why I'm bringing the hymn up is that I, I, I didn't did some follow-up questions. He just kind of ignored me. I got the sense that he thought of me as not that bright. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and as I said earlier, it's not a need that I have. Um, it, I don't know, I just not, I, I sense, and I hate to say this, but it just, he just kind of felt sociopathic to me in his response. And I thought, isn't it funny that I'm like the dumb, like social justice guy who's like offended by you that you said these dragons have low IQ. And I'm like the dumb guy over there just to be laughed off and oh God, here we go again, the snowflake emotional guy. And then over here, I'm like, on my other page and my own, you know, I was other person because I dared to say, I dared to show something. I never use anything from Fox, but I, I did. I did on that day. I dared to choose something from Fox: a black woman and a white man who are a mixed couple who are concerned about the, um, you know, some of the ideologically extreme ideas that are coming into their children's schools that are pitting people against each other. And they were, they were, they spoke probably in more generalities than we would have, than we would have liked, and they would use some statements maybe were tone deaf or they weren't sophisticated academics like we all are but she just kind of she was so angry disappointed that that I dared to even show it but she just couldn't believe it it was very disappointing and I felt really and I realized and then she I don't want to go this back and forth with you and then she wrote many questions and then I responded the next day and respectfully too and I that's how I talked about dignitarianism um, my point that I'm making is that she, she now thinks I'm a very bad person, and this guy thinks I'm a dumb idiot, emotional mess, or not, right? And I'm, I'm exaggerating too, by the way. Not, I don't want to, neither, you know. And this is another thing I want to kind of throw, and I'm sorry I'm just kind of going down these different rabbit holes. And no, it's bring, interesting. Bring, bring me back. <laughs> bring me back. Um, now, I'm to, in fact, just, it makes me think of epistemic humility. So then we had the problem of the, oh, am I now this arrogant centrist who thinks that he's better than everybody else because he's not an ideological totalist, right? Then there's that like, oh, I'm above it. I'm, and they actually have a name for this. I'm meta hovering. I haven't chosen a side. It's like, no, 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 no. Um, I have empirical reasons for not really going along with the, um, the, dra the dragons uh, that belong to these identity groups are laughably dumb, low IQ. And I don't think it's even worth pursuing after all. I mean, I know it's just anecdotal, but don't, I don't know, I think quanti quantitative and qualitative evidence from I've gathered the past 25 years working with green and purple dragons everywhere. I don't have a lot, I just, I'm not convinced of it. So that's not me okay. not taking it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, you, you don't hold a view to the effect that the reason there are inequalities between blacks and, or people of color and oh, white people in the US is because the people of color have lower IQs. That's, that's pretty well established, but yeah. What would you say to this other conservative view, which is, it's not that most people of color have low IQs, it's that a small number of people of color are making it hard for everyone else and blaming white people when it's that small group of people of color who won't integrate into society, commit crime, are more represented in homicide, are likely to kill other black people and so on and so forth. That should be the true target of social justice rage. <clears throat> it should be that small group of criminal black people, not 
the whole of white society. What do you think of that idea? I think, I think, okay, so a couple of things. Thank you for bringing me back. Um, so I, we know, we, we, hear this, we, hear the, we hear the statistic often that 50% of the, you know, of the violent crime, I mean, I, I'm not good at numbers, so never mind that. Uh, yes, a very large number of, of violent crimes are, are, you know, perpetrated by, um, by African-American males. And it's just, this is, this is facts that most people are not disagreeing on, left and right, okay? And I know that um, when I'm, when I'm, what, what, what you're not supposed to say, and, the, and if you do, you're gonna get ruined. <laughs> you're not supposed to say, yeah, but what about black on black crime, right? And so I certainly won't even use that phrase. And um, what I would like to say is that there are just so many people that are scared of their own neighborhoods. And um, who, you know, it's, this is not well known, but, and I don't, I wish I could remember the name of the book, uh, the, name of the name of the movement, but the, the strongest supporters of the Crime Bill Act of 1994 mm -hmm. that happened in the United States, the strongest proponents were black parents. Who are tired of seeing their children being killed? Um, this was uh, this is not well known. It's, it's certainly not talked about on the left. You'll never hear that, you know, on MSNBC. But it's actually true. Um, but another thing is that. Just give me a moment. I want to I want to get this right. Obviously. <sighs> God, it's so it is complex. Why can't it be a both and? I mean, sorry. I guess I'm being a Moderate, once again, I write that letter from the Birmingham jail. Here he goes again. Well, you know what? We should probably, um, first of all, we should be funding the schools more. We should be changing the, the tax structure so that we're not putting black kids in schools that are underfunded. And we should be, they should be getting uh, tutors as much as the rich white kids over here. You know, I mean, it's not like uh, that the crime is coming at a kind uh, out of nowhere, and I had told you certain anecdotes of my own of the students I've seen. By the way, I've had students that, that have also been, been killed. You know, mm -hmm. uh, um, I have um, a couple, actually, several. Um, and so many of them have, writ have written stories of brothers and sisters killed and sent to jail. So uh, give me a second here. So the framing of um, what about black and black crime is not helpful. That is just going to make people angry. So are you are you sort of divided about this issue? Where you think it's it's kind of it's not useful to enunciate a perspective from the right, which says that the inequalities between the dominant and non-dominant group in a society are primarily the fault of the non-dominant group. But right. you may also be saying, well, it could be true, even though it makes people angry. I know. Okay. So I, I know, and you can see me hedging too. I know you can see it, of course. Like, you know, I'm, this is, my friends all make fun of the, the, the cancel culture phrase. They all, everyone just makes fun of me for even, oh, he's turning right wing. What do you mean? I can't even have a direct conversation without worrying about how, right? I got to use purple and, 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 and whatever the hell that was, the dragons, because I don't want any sort of sound bite to come out. And I, I don't know. My, maybe eventually I'm going to be a lot more boom, but Jesus, crime. Um, all right. This is what I know. I know that the poverty rate in Black America is unfair. I know, I feel I know, okay, that there has been an, a, a sense of intergenerational trauma. There's been a psychological uh, in a sense, self self oppression just from growing up in that marginalized condition for many of them, and living in neighborhoods that aren't taken care of, or houses are kind of broken down, and and in, and in certain um, schools that are not well funded, and uh, you know, and 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 seeing uh, at least for a long time, it's not happening anymore as much, but you know, seeing movie, seeing the whole world presented where you're not even represented very as often as you'd like or I just want to what I'm trying to do is I want to paint a bit of a complex picture that that contributes to the crime okay there's mm -hmm. a context in which the crime is being created and so it I sounds like what you're describing is a feedback loop 
Yeah, yeah, it's a feedback loop. But I also want to be clear, um, I'm, I'm going to get to the other part, trust me, I promise, and briefly. Uh, I know, I'm telling you, I know this. I'm telling you right now, Alfred Tatum um, wrote a really great book called Teaching Black, Boy, uh, Black Adolescent Boys How to Read. And again, because I, you know, I didn't come prepared with a bunch of list of names I wanted to throw out. But uh, there's a, there are several writers, black men, who are writing about this. Lit I actually wrote one essay about this recently. Literacy, 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 literacy. If the if 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 our young black men are to, are going to succeed in this country, this is the Eric Smith's talking. Okay, that's why. I, and I do this for a living. I would not normally speak, right? I understand mm -hmm. the idea of, I don't pretend to be a, an expert on those, these issues, but I do have to care enough because I do it, I teach, right? right? In urban environments. So I have to talk about these things. I need to wrestle with them. Um, literacy. If the language of wider communication is what I, I talked about earlier, some people still call standard American English, academic English. Um, the president of my college, black woman, wonderful, brilliant mind, gorgeous, like articulation style. Like she's, when you read what she writes, just even an email, it's, and, and you see a public appearance on YouTube talking to the city council. Um, and and it's, this is the, the language that she has mastered is the language that helps our students. And um, oh, this is so interesting. I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, I, I have so many stories to tell you. I'll just tell you, I'll, I'll only say to you that I, I are, there are so many students of color that I have personally taught how to read. And I mean, reading recovery. I told you how I began my career that way. Um, who didn't know, and I'm not making fun. This is, it's just a lack of understanding of how to decode words phonetically. So not even knowing that at the end of a word, shun is spelled T-I-O-N and T-I-A-N or C-I-O-N or S-I-A, or you might not even know this, um, if it's I-A-N, it's a person. If it's I-O-N, it's a place or a thing. So station is a place. Christian is a person. That's why they're spelled slightly different. These are things that can be systematically taught. And then when a student actually finally learns it, it's absolutely incredible what happens mm -hmm. to them. I had a girl, and this is who, I'm not making this up. Her name, okay, I'll call her Diane. <laughs> I want to respect privacy, right? So she calls me up on my cell phone because my students did have my phone number, right? Some of them. Uh, just for emergencies and stuff. Um, she called me, she was in high school, years later. And she said, Mr. Lawrence, Mr. Lawrence. And she said, I got accepted into advanced placement. Now, when I met her, Diane, she came up to me, and I'm telling you, she came up to me, the first thing she said, and it was a school for kids that were expelled, okay? She came up to me and she goes, hi, Mr. Lawrence, my name is Diane, and I'm SPED. I said, what do you mean, SPED? I know what SPED is. Do you? You probably don't. No offense. But, no, no, um, I don't. You have to yeah, yeah, it's me. Education jargon, right. But I pretended not to know what it meant. But what it means is special ed, special education. Oh, I do know that, yes. So she had an identity of lesser than-ness. She really did. And that was trained into her. That was trained in her. It, she was taught to see herself that way. Now, I can look at that, and I could say that that's, we could say it's white supremacy culture. We could say that it's the, the, de the degradation of Blacks culture. I don't know, but I do know this. It was learned and it wasn't true. So then I, I, I taught her for, I don't know, two or three months. And then I had her in seventh grade, then eighth grade. And she blossomed because as you know, then when she was able, she couldn't, when I say she couldn't read, I mean, she couldn't decode words. And that's not a small matter, it's huge. Once she got the mechanics down of breaking words into syllables, and we practiced using nonsense words like intermactive estabulator, no such thing, but it follows the same rules of, you know, of English. She was an advanced placement, and I was not surprised, but I was delighted. She comes to me and says she's sped, and now four years later, she's in an advanced placement, which they're now they're getting rid of, though, because it hurts Black people. God damn it. Her sense of self is, it was expanded. And um, the ideas that she had access to, it's incredible. Oh, oh my God, sorry. Just, it just, just one woman, I, I, another black woman who I was a student of mine in three classes, the last one she took with me was contemporary social issues. And mm -hmm. boy, did she blossom too. But one day we talked about, I showed this video 
of the of the of the it's called the tour of the universe is we're we're going into a um a, a unit of study called the art of argument and i wanted the students to start off on the multi-perspectivalism which but look at the universe you know mm-hmm. and it got her thinking and then we had this long conversation and she was asking these really deep philosophical questions that i was shocked to hear because we didn't bring that stuff up in class yet but just that one video got her thinking and then i turned around to herman hess siddhartha and um, Stephen Hawking. So all I'm saying to you is, is that um, I, I really do think that a lot of um, students that are of color are, are not properly, they're not treated, I don't feel, at least they haven't been, a, or in my experience, they're not always treated like they are capable and, and amazing. So I know I'm sounding corny right now, but so going back to the same, uh, and alongside that, that kind of degradation uh, is what are you, what else are you going to do? My sister, I'm so well, I just threw it out her. She was a sister that got killed by cops. She couldn't read. She, she led a life of survival choices and petty crimes. That's why she drove away from the cops because she had no license and she was stoned and drunk. It's the fact. So the, 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 the sister, and, and she was of a different color skin, but I assure you, we did live in the neighborhoods, the same neighborhoods. And we had the same degradation, not the same extent. I know, I understand that and I appreciate that. But I do think that literacy and education are, are big uh, systemic. I'm gonna call it systemic racial, give me a moment. Systemic disenfranchisement. It's, it's a much better word to use because then we can talk about, huh, there's disenfranchisement happening throughout the entire system. That's interesting. Then we don't have to get necessarily get into a fight about is it because of racism or not? We can go, you guys can fight about that, but I'm more interested in the actual, um, the, the phenomenon of it. And then, so that, that so I, want, I know it's a very long partial answer, but that part's there, that's the left, okay? The right, they're right about this too, responsibility. Um, because the same students that I would, would spend all my time with, with, with teaching how to read, they also, I'm like, you know, you can't come into this classroom and that crazy like this, it's not right. Who do you think you are acting this way? when everyone else has the right to, to, to learn. You know, you gotta maintain, that's the classroom management. So responsibility is important in the teaching of that and the modeling of it also. And I do think that, I hate to say it, conservatives might not be wrong on this, but I don't wanna make enemies of my communist friends. Oh, well, sorry. But yeah, fatherless homes, you know, um, or, you know, uh, single family homes is actually a better way to put it. Um, they're not all that great, it seems. But I'm not going to, you know, push the marriage ideal. Maybe there is something to it takes a village, and we don't need this the traditional cis heteronormative picture. You see what I mean? It, what do, what do you think of the idea that um, it's it's problematic to say something like systemic inequality because inequality is just the default of human nature and society. It's actually the equality that is systemic um, when you get it. And it's unlikely that you would ever get any sort of systemic equality of outcome between different groups of people, because whenever people are free and diverse and they can do different things, they make different choices at the macro level when you look at populations. So we shouldn't be angry at systemic inequality because we should expect to see it. That's what human beings are. Human beings are different. And that's why you have inequality in the first place. Okay. So completing that last thought and then bouncing on this one or responding to this one, uh, the, the, the conservative, if you will, perspective of responsibility is important. We do have to come rise up a little bit. I had a tough life too. I did not, I'm not comparing, not doing the what about is, I'm simply noting that I had to rise above some pretty bad circumstances, even in my adult years, especially in my adult years in a lot of ways. Um, sudden deaths will do that to you, for you. Um, so there's that. And um, maybe, you know, putting people in jail uh, who com- consistently commit violent crimes. I'm sorry, but like, no, I don't know. I'd like to pretend to be totally leftist about everything, but get abandoned, get, getting rid of all the jails and all the police. Come on. People, there, there is, people do have sometimes criminal tendencies. We all do, really. I mean, I mean we have limitations are important. Boundaries are important. It's also wisdom. Wisdom asks us to, to embrace that. And I think that there's too much of the safetyism culture 
They think they can create no boundaries, no boundaries at all, no boundaries around the nation, no boundaries around the house, get rid of all the keys, get rid of the cops, get rid of the jails. Okay. But every, everything I said earlier about taking care of the students and all that, I think by now I've demonstrated I'm not some hard nosed right wing, you know, it's insensitive, whatever. But are they wrong that we need structure and boundaries and law? No, they were right about that. And then you just said something about um, trade-offs. I want to talk about trade-offs. Right. So um, there are some equality inequalities that we can fix and we should. But I think that what makes the right, I think it's really interesting. I read a recent essay about midwits, the idea of the midwit. Uh, what makes the right interesting to me more than it used to be is, is, is because less theoretical. It's less bounded by theory. And so there's a little more freedom to investigate phenomena without the boundedness of theory. Sometimes theory precludes our ability to see what's actually there. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if we find phenomena that don't match the theory, we actually do all these mental gymnastics to make it fit the theory. And if the theory includes like um, strong moral clauses that you'd be punished if you don't look at things according to the theory, then it becomes a real problem. Yeah, it becomes so, like a fundamentalist religion. Yeah, and so that's what's happened to the left, which is why I can't say I've left the left, right? I haven't, and I won't say the left left me. I'll simply say that I'm, I, uh, I appreciate so much, except for the theory part, the, the ideological totalism, the frameworking, the endless buzzword. We've hypnotized ourselves away from seeing things as they are. Um, and so back to your question about what would they, what would you say to these, right? You're saying about um, there will always be inequalities. Exactly. As I said earlier, there's going to be pain. There's going to be loneliness. You're not going to get laid sometimes. Sometimes you're not going to have the money to get that vacation. Sometimes the per you'll get one student will die and you couldn't have done anything. To sometimes a student won't want to read. Never mind your wonderful, fancy after school special violins. He's taught her how to read now. Sometimes they are jerks. A student might be a jerk. I haven't had one in a long time because I don't teach middle school anymore. Sometimes you have a bad teacher. Sometimes you just, uh, life is just, it's painful. And, and we have to learn to be a little anti-fragile and to be with that a little bit. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but everyone's going to die someday. But they want to- I didn't know that. that. No, you didn't know? I didn't know that. Are we going to legislate that away as well? Are we going to regulate that? Well, this is a difficult issue because independently of politics, it does seem like we are living in a society where because of increasing technology, life expectancy, education, and a lot of other things, even socialization in some ways, uh, which are quite positive, yeah. we expect a lot more from society in terms of protection. And in some ways, you know, I even I get ambivalent there because in some ways I can see some kids growing up with assistance that I didn't get for problems that I had. And I think, well, I'm not against that necessarily. But then when I see the weaponization of victimhood and I see kids demanding things that are really unreasonable and adults capitulating in the name of the kid's mental health, that pisses me off. But I'm still ambivalent about, you know, whether I want more or less safety generally. I'm not one of these people that would say, let's throw people to the wolves and, and allow them to develop their agency that way. I'm very ambivalent about safety culture. It's so like the Spartans, like didn't the Spartans do that with their babies or children? Throw them over the hill and want the ones that survive, they can join the army, I forget. Yeah, a lot of conservative rhetoric to me sounds like it's the psychological equivalent of that when it comes to safety. Yeah, so. yeah. This guy last night, because he was very, he was articulate and smart and perfect, but dismissive and kind of rude. And clearly, uh, I just felt like, yeah, you're, you're just being that whole conservative sociopathic bullshit. Sorry, it, it does get a little annoying. It's like, I have to go with either over all emotion all the time or sociopath <laughs> that's the far left and far right respectively uh, i mean far like you know i'm, I'm yeah. exaggerating obviously well it does seem like when it comes to things like mental health at least the right-leaning position on everything unless you get like a, a right-wing clinical therapist like jordan peterson who might be a bit more moderate ironically yeah 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 but the right-leaning position on everything on mental health is you know tough too bad yeah. deal with it you just Sorry. really you just really helped me right now, more than you know. I, that was the simplest thing you said that, that made all the difference. It, 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 that I think that's what it is. Wow. I'm when it comes to mental health, I am a I am a left wing all the way. I am. Uh, 
uh, in that in that being a primary value and an important one and me and i've also experienced i you know i, I have in fact myself experienced traumatization i have uh, i after the first death i experienced you know as i mentioned i actually fell asleep with a light on for two years like as if i was some kind of child you know there was a it was such a overwhelmingly it was just traumatizing just was you know you never you know, some people, the, their legs will give out when they get the bad news and that actually happened. Um, so, so yeah, they're, they're trauma, creating trauma-informed environments is important, not just in a, in a classroom, but in a country, you know? Um, and I think we are, ourselves are being collectively traumatized by the, by the way, that, by the rhetoric it's out there too. The way that the news never ends and it's so nasty now. And, but you're right, the right-wing um, position when it comes to mental health is usually tough to deal with it. But see, I, I have to go back now. I was going to say I'm as far left as it can be. And now I'm like, no, you're not, Steve. Come back, come back. No, I'm not. Because I still think anti-fragility is important. And anti-fragility, while also responsibly protecting your nervous system and protecting the nervous systems of others from unnecessary preventable traumas, okay? Unnecessary preventable traumas. It's not a bad thing to create policies and laws and, and you know, on all levels, schools, cities, states, neighborhoods, countries, uh, that can reduce to the, to the extent possible. But, and this is what you were saying earlier, but you can't make life perfect. You yeah. just can't. It's never going to be. Maybe the, maybe the best middle ground position to take is something like, okay, we're going to have an exchange. What we're going to do is we're going to give you assistance for all the things that you can't do that have biological or neurological or even trauma oriented beginnings but in exchange for that you're going to do your best with what it is you can do and you're not going to slack off when we see that coming from you we're going to feel like okay we're holding up our end of the bargain our end of the bargain you're going to be holding up and you are holding up your end of the bargain it's two ways yeah, well. yeah I, I, I that sounds great you know it sounds it sounds like it's workable and it's it's wisdom you know it's, it's a, I hope you get there at least a little bit. Whereas it seems like what happened is everything is out of balance. You went from, we're not going to acknowledge your problems or care about you at all to mm -hmm. suddenly um, every little problem that you might possibly have, we're going to accommodate and you don't have to give back anything except just your victimhood status and you'll get, you know, glorified for it. And that's not healthy either, but we need is something in the middle. Yeah, yeah, and you know it's funny because I, when I when I when I undertook these writing projects, um, it was because uh, I wanted to sort out for myself where I stood, even if I wound up leaving teaching, and I might. I mean, it's not exactly the most hospitable career for people like me these days, um, and but maybe I might stick it out. Who knows? I might have a decades ahead. I sure hope so. I do enjoy it, um, but yes, the the the, the culture. It's, it's, I hate, I, mean, I hate to say it, but it's, it's not, it's pure unadulterated narcissism. It's, I it's, would go a step further. I think it's a combination of narcissism and sadism. Oh, that's a very good point. It's look you know, at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And if you don't, you're going to get punished. Yeah. Yeah. Acknowledge me, acknowledge me, acknowledge me. If you don't, just because you're a very bad person, you're going to get punished. Yeah. Uh, but there's also a lot of artifacts to go along with that. You know, I have a friend who, uh, I was actually offering to pay money to to give me advice on a, a site that I was creating that kind of attempted to compile certain themes from articles and videos. You've seen it. Uh, you're actually one of your articles is on it. But I actually oh, was it equity and symbolic paranoia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so good. It's so great. It's symbolic paranoia, and that's where it gave me the idea of cryptonoia, of cryptoia which mm -hmm. is basically believing that there's, there's evil everywhere. And it, 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 it's like, it's like the, 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 the bigotry is hiding cryptically. It's cryptic, you know, crypto racism or crypto fascism. It's like constantly searching for signs that something evil is afoot. It's not really healthy. It's very unhealthy thinking. Well, because um, it makes you not notice the non-cryptic in your face bigotry that's coming from you. Right. And, and, and it's not just, it's also a crypto, cryptonoia. I like the phrase, or is it, should I call it cryptoia or cryptonoia? I like cryptonoia. It's kind of weird sounding, but um, but cryptoids, as we can call them, right? Cryptoid cryptoids will they'll they'll they don't they don't 
not just look for signs that you're being bigoted or ignoring them, they look for signs that you're oppressing them or taking advantage of them in some way. So I had a friend like suddenly, a uh, friend uh, I was getting advice for and then said, well, I have to go, I have other unpaid work to do. And I'm like, we're friends, we're having a dialogue. Why are you calling this unpaid labor? So this idea of like, I'm putting all this labor in, I don't know, there's, there's a real entitlement now to never being put upon. But that feels very, that, that's what I mean by narcissism. It's very, I don't know, I can't, I, I'm not good at describing it, I guess. Well, it seems uh, like the, the kind of, um, I don't know, I, I don't think that the transgender it's, politics are necessarily um, the par exemplar of, of narcissistic culture, but they seem to be setting a precedent for a lot of other ideas and etiquette that are doing sort of similar narcissistic maneuvers. That's like saying, for instance, that, you know, holding your shoes on the red carpet is heroism. Right, yeah. And, and uh, I actually had a debate, the, the debate I, I had with a friend yesterday online, really good person, but I was upset, I was concerned that back, they're calling all these parents terrorists. You know, this, 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 this Hollywood actress is a hero for, pick, for taking her shoes off, her high heel shoes off. And this parent is a terrorist because they don't want their kid put in a separate room and told that he's a bad person because people his skin color did bad things in history, and that and these must these must be right wing domestic terrorists. Uh, it can't be that they're actually concerned about their kid being emotionally abused for a greater for the greater good. And yeah, that's it, the most frightening it, tactic of the left is yeah, to say anything scary. which is critical of us has people on the far right who agree. The far yeah. right is evil. Therefore, They're, anybody who doesn't like us yeah. is part of the far right and evil, and we have a right to treat them as uh, something like, we can really? completely ostracize and get rid of from yeah. polite society and possibly throw in jail. And you can see why I'm I, throughout this whole dialogue, I would sort of it substitute wor certain words and phrases because I don't want to even have any soundbite out there that, you know, so I kept saying purple and I forget the other color, but purple and orange dragon IQs because I don't even want to go there. And, and by the way, transgender, you mentioned it. I didn't mention it, and I'll say nothing more. I'm actually pro. <laughs> I'm poor. I'm pro. Real quick. I'm pro transgender rights. Now I mean this too. I do have uh, several friends who are, and one of them was is probably still among the top five like bosses I have ever had. Uh, this, this person, I'm going to use the word they. They were my uh, my college professor. I mean, it, it was a college you know mentor who gave me my first opportunity, you know, to be a college professor. And I loved this person's mind and heart and a great management style, like just one of the truly, and I mean this, best leaders. Be, and that's aside from the gender identity. That's just, I'm just noting that. So I have a loyalty there, right? Of course, just, just the personal feelings. And I would never want anyone to feel like they weren't, but that person also is not demand, it, 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 I can't explain it. It's this person is somebody I have a lot of, uh, what's the word looking for? Respect for and uh, a lot of personal warmth towards. Um, and, and they're non gender, um, they're, so excuse me, they're um, neutral gender, non binary. And um, I say this, uh, and so it, when I do this thing with my students in one of my classes where it's very traditional, there's nothing fancy about it. Where I'll, I'll do like a vote on your feet exercise where I'll say, um, I love uh, if, I, if any statement I make move to this side of the room, it's not this side or that, right? I'll say, I have um, a love for mathematics. And then some students will move over to this side of the room, others move on that side of the room, and then maybe a couple be in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, you know, I'll say things like, I have, I, I, know, I love star, the Star Wars movies. So I would start with something trivial, but then I would ask bigger questions because we were studying education during this unit of study. I want students to become self-aware of the educational enterprise itself, including teaching and learning styles, actually. And I would say, like, you know, I've been uh, um, uh, personally attacked by a teacher, like, like emotionally, like put down by a teacher when I was growing up. And then it moved. And then at one point, and I usually I do this intentionally, I'll say something like, um, I am a woman. Right. Or I'm a man, you know, and then or, or male or female. And they'll move. And there's almost always strict binaries, which is not surprising. And so far, because I'm not at a, you know, I'm at a, I'm just so far, there has not been anyone in the middle. But what I say, and I do this intentionally because I do want my students to be aware of what's out there, just to be aware, you know. I would say, I just, just let you know, and I'll use this language. 
I just want to put out into the space that some people may may choose to be in the middle though. There are some people who don't identify, you know, as strictly as a particular gender, male, female. And I just want them to sort of, I just want us to sort of keep that, just kind of be aware of it, that's all. And then in my writing instruction, um, and even in my speaking, I'll actually use, uh, when I, when I, I'll, I'll say, I won't default to he. I've trained myself to, to just mix it up between they, he, and she when I'm speaking about generalities, like, I don't know, I can't think of one right now, but, it, you know, but I'll, I'll look, in my student writings, I'll say, I would, I would ask them to just try to be more inclusive. And it's not that I'm trying to indoctrinate them into leftist thought. I'm not trying to indoctrinate them to gender, um, gender identity or gender theory. Um, it, it's more that as, a, as an instructor of writing, which is also in some ways also contemporary social issues, we also literally study the art of argument, these things come up. And I think it's good for my students to have an understanding that the language of wider communication in this borderless world, like the, it's not, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. Gender, non-traditional, non-conforming gender identity is not going away. And I think making room for that is good. <laughs> um, I see it as a net positive, but you were saying earlier, and I want to acknowledge that there is, um, there is a culture of, ex it's not easy to describe it, but there's a culture of, um, again, first of all, fashionable meanness, uh, demanding sadistic punishment for not acknowledging one's nonconformity. That does seem to come out of the young, very young people who are first trying on different identities, okay? Mm -hmm. And when you combine that with a culture of safetyism, um, and you combine that with um, the, uh, the uh, stigmatization of some values that we really should not have lost. Uh, and this is where Jonathan Haidt's work is fantastic. Uh, there are values on con the conservative side and, the, and, the, um, and I wanna say liberal, but I don't think the left is liberal anymore, but anyway, uh, <laughs> but there, there, there's not, it's illiberal. It's not freedom though. Certainly they're not cognitive liberty people. I love Peter Boghossian's idea of cognitive libertarianism. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're not cognitive liber libertarians, they're cognitive no, authoritarians. It's cognitive authoritarianism is a real problem on the left right now. Um, and, and we need the, 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 some of the, you know, because what, what we both consider right wing, I consider generally, it's generally about preserving what has worked and functioned and that has been built over so long. And it's not all evil and should be torn down. And one of those is there are, some, there are values about stand up a little bit in this world and don't expect everyone to like you. That's a pretty good thing to kind of learn. I think it's well, a natural, you, I don't know what you call that. Like, sorry, but, but, but now we're going to go around and demand that everyone respect and love us and admire us. And I don't know about that. Well, the last question I'm going to ask you because okay. you're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. Is what would you say to the person who says that the sadism is not an accident. The sadism comes from gender nonconformity because if we have gender nonconformity, that means, for instance, that I can say, I identify as a woman, despite looking like this, you, Stephen, you must see me and refer to me the way that I see myself. And if you don't wanna go along with it, you're gonna to have to get punished until you do. So the gender identity openness, is itself lending itself to and needs to rely on sadism to enforce it. What would you say to that? I don't think so. I think it's characterological and I think it's individual. I, I, I see, I, that's gender essentialism and I hate it. I, I, I'm such an, I, I, if there's anything I'm so like my own self dogmatic and fierce about is mm -hmm. group identity essentialism. I know transgender people who would never do that. They wouldn't even think to do that. They didn't get help. What about uh, what, uh, Blair White, for example? She's a transgender and she's a male to female transgender and she's definitely self-identifies as, I think she self-identifies as right wing, but she certainly is libertarian. She's definitely a cognitive libertarian. She doesn't do that. So if it's true that the gender nonconformity itself is, is somehow a, 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 the progenitor of, or at least is, is, the, is the generator of, I know you're not really saying that. Um, I do think that the ideology the specific ideological ideological artifacts that go along with some gender identity gender gender identity theories, those are problematic. 
and they they and, and almost insist on that kind of behavior. Uh, you know, for just a quick thing. So so just the idea of complicity. Going back to race just for a moment, and I do forget the social justice writer's name. You know, um, I, I know I, I referenced it in one of the essays, and which I took from the book *Cynical Theories* by James Lindsay and Helen Pluck Rose. Uh, but the idea of uh, once you say that, you know, it's called white, you know, disfavored identity group complicity, and once you establish complicity as belonging to an entire identity group, then there has to be punishment. So, so it's not the gender nonconformity. It's not the nonconformity of the gender identity that's causing it. It's the ideological artifacts that have come along. Like, it's almost like, um, I, it's like you had a really great dinner, but that potato salad was really awful. Uh, and it was so bad that like it spilled into the rest of the, of the, of the plate and then made the whole plate really bad. Nonconforming is fantastic, great, let's do it. This other stuff, that's really bad. We should stop doing that. The witch huntery, the punishments, the extreme narcissism, the sadism, the fashionable meanness, the victim, constant victim, the belief that the world is full of evil everywhere and there's no goodness, no universals and all of that, one last thing. We have the capacity, I believe this, and I'll go to the grave with it. We have the capacity to empathize with others. I can empathize with a transgender person, a straight person, a white person, a black person, a brown, Muslim, Christian, gay, straight, and I believe that they can all empathize with me. They have that capacity. It's truly, deeply, universally true and human. And it's so terrible to me that that idea is considered bad. And that's that's an artifact that must be fought and it must be defeated, I'll be honest with you. And on that note, I totally <laughs> agree with you on that last point. And thank you so much for doing this. It was really yeah. lovely to chat with you. Oh my God, this is really fun. Yeah, I really appreciate it. You're very, you have a nice, uh, you're very, you're, you're a good dance partner. Very good. Thank you. This is Greg Scorzo, and that was the Culture and the Offensive podcast. If you like this podcast, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you're interested in any of the other things that we do at Coda Publishing, check us out at www.cultureandtheoffensive.com. So stay safe, be courageous, and don't forget to go outside of your comfort zone. And remember, when you hear things that sound wrong or silly or stupid or strange, don't forget to use everything clarity and courage. <laughs>